Good afternoon. The next item of business today is a debate on motion 8558 in the name of John Swinney on presumption of mainstreaming. I would invite all members who wish to speak in this debate to press their request to speak buttons now. And I call on John Swinney to speak to and move the motion in his name. Presiding officer, a commitment to and a belief in inclusive education has underpinned the approach to education policy and legislation in this parliament since 2000. The Standards in Scotland Schools Act was one of the first pieces of legislation ever passed by this Parliament and it featured a requirement that education for all children should be provided in mainstream schools except in prescribed exceptional circumstances. Those provisions commenced in 2002 and their importance cannot be overstated. They created an entitlement for children and young people whose parents previously had often had to fight simply for, their right to be, uh, for, the, for the right of their children to be educated at all. The presumption to mainstream, as it has become known, firmly closed the door on the institutionalization of pupils who needed support and recognized their, the value to society, to communities and to families of pupils learning in their own communities, wherever possible, but allowing those who needed specialist support to receive it. We now have the first generation of young people who have experienced mainstream education as a consequence of the rights that were established under that legislation. And we have seen the fruits of the involvement of those young people in our society and in our communities where they have been able to obtain their education. In 2004, this parliament went even further than the 2000 uh, legislation and created a truly inclusive approach to education through the groundbreaking Additional Support for Learning Act. The Act fundamentally changed the way in which children and young people are supported in schools. It moved away from a model of medical deficit to a legislative framework which focused on barriers to children's and young people's learning. It recognised that children and young people experience barriers as a result of a range of reasons, including as a result of disability or health needs, but also recognising that family circumstances, learning environment and social and emotional factors can play a part in creating barriers, not all of them long term, to a child learning effectively in school. The key point of the legislation is that children and young people have rights to have those needs identified, assessed, and they should receive the support that they need when they need it to overcome anything that gets in the way of their learning. It is worth recalling, presiding officer, that both of the acts to which I have referred were put in place by our predecessors in government. And since coming to power in 2007, this government has continued to embed its commitment to inclusive education in policy and in legislation. We've updated and revised the additional support for learning legislation and the associated guidance to ensure that the Act is effectively implemented first in 2009 and again last year. And the wider policies which underpin school education in Scotland Curriculum for Excellence, Getting It Right for Every Child, and our most recent developments on Raising Attainment for All and the Scottish, education, uh, the Scottish Attainment Challenge, in addition to our educational reforms, all focus on the need to tackle inequality, to create a fairer Scotland, to put each and every child's needs and interests at the heart of the educational system. What this demonstrates is the difference that this Parliament has made by its dialogue around these subjects and the difference that Parliament can continue to make when it comes together around shared values and works together to make change happen in a relatively short time span. We should not forget the difference that we can and we do make to the people of Scotland as a consequence of that concerted all-party action in this Parliament. At its heart, Inclusive education does not just tolerate diversity, but importantly, it promotes and celebrates that diversity within our society. It allows all children and young people to develop an understanding and a recognition of differences within our society. This contributes to the development of an increasingly, increasingly inclusive, empathetic, empathetic and more just society. It also affords children and young people the opportunity to be part of a community boosting their emotional well-being and aiding the development of social skills. But inclusive education also needs diversity in provision. There needs to be a range of educational settings available to ensure that children learn in the environment that best meets their needs. In practice, 
That means mainstream schools, special schools, units within mainstream schools and flexible placements. I want to be clear that there will be no change to the legislation on mainstreaming in Scotland. This government will neither commit to a system where all children must learn in mainstream schools, nor to a system where all children with additional support needs must learn in special schools. We will continue to have legislation which maintains the presumption to mainstream education and allow those whose needs are best met in specialist provision or, to have a, or a mix to have that objective fulfilled. There are a wide range of positive examples of support provisions across Scotland. I saw for myself yesterday in Grangemouth at the opening of the Karen Grange High School, an absolutely fantastic facility which provides special needs education for young people across a range of different circumstances and experiences. And what was striking to me in the development that has been taken forward at Karen Grange High School in partnership between the Scottish Government and Falkirk Council is the creation of a learning environment which, is, which reflects the needs and the requirements of young people with uh, special educational needs and de deploys those needs uh, and those services within a world-class educational facility which creates uh, a, a tremendous opportunities for young people. It also was very clear that, that's, that education was being delivered within a context of very strong staff commitment and staff provision to ensure that the adequate resources were in place to meet the needs of individual young people. So the settings of education will vary, but fundamentally the government operates on the principle that we should de deliver mainstream education where we possibly can and exceptional provision has to be made available within our society uh, as part of that proposition. We have a clear agenda for education focused on creating a world-class education system which delivers excellence and equity for all children and young people. That does not mean that everything has to be the same and experienced in the same way, but that children and young people should have equal opportunities to reach their full potential. The approach we are taking is making a difference. We have more children identified and receiving additional support in schools. Children and young people who need support for any reason, short or long term, have been recognised and supported in schools across Scotland. We are supporting children and young people who until a few years ago would not have received support. Support for the bereaved, those from armed forces families, those from whose parents are imprisoned, and of course able pupils are now commonplace alongside those who would traditionally have received support for autism, dyslexia, sensory impairment, and of course pupils with disabilities. The outcomes for children and young people with additional support needs have been and continue to improve. Some of the data in this respect is as follows. Since 2010-11, attendance for pupils with additional support needs has continued to improve in primary, secondary and special schools with a total percentage improvement of 1.1%. The overall rate of exclusion for all pupils has more than halved since 2006-07 due to the continued focus by schools and education authorities to build on and improve their relationship with children and young people most at risk of exclusion in their learning communities. However, for pupils who have an additional support need, more needs to be done as those pupils continue to experience a higher rate of exclusion from school. That is unacceptable and more needs to be done to reduce these numbers. Children and young people with additional support needs are gaining more and better qualifications than they ever have. 60.7% of 2014-15 of school leavers with additional support needs left school with one or more qualification at SCQF level 5 or better. 84.6% of 2014-15 school leavers with ASN left school with one or more qualification at SCQF level 4 or better. This is all leading to positive outcomes with more young people with additional support needs gaining positive destinations than ever before. 86.9% of pupils with additional support needs have a positive destination. 19% of pupils with additional support needs went on to higher education. 38.6% went to further education. And 28.6% went on to employment, training or volunteering. 
These achievements are testament to the role played by a professional teaching workforce and the wide range of practitioners and professionals who provide the support that children need in their learning. Nor should we forget the role played by parents and families to support their children's learning and often the role they need to play in order to ensure that their children's rights are respected and that they get the education they are entitled to in a setting that best meets their needs. We all know of constituents and sometimes also family members and friends who are these parents. And while we can and should reflect on all that we've done in the past to create and maintain inclusive education and how that has contributed to a real shift in attitudes and achievements today, we must also acknowledge that there is more that needs to be done. The recent evidence to Parliament's Education and Skills Committee demonstrates that the right decisions are not being made for all children and that young people, uh, and young people, and that for some, inclusive education is still a policy rather than their everyday experience. We remain committed to mainstreaming as a central pillar of our inclusive approach to education. The Scottish approach to inclusion is already world leading. Our legislative and policy commitments are amongst the most extensive in the world. However, we must work to improve the experience of inclusion for all pupils if we are to deliver on the promise of such an ambitious framework. That is why today I'm announcing that the government will consult on guidance on the presumption of mainstreaming. This guidance aims to bridge the gap between legislation, policy and day-to-day -day experience to ensure that local authorities have the information and the support they need to guide their decision making in applying the presumption of mainstream education and looks to encourage a, a child-centred approach to making decisions around placement. As the implementation of the presumption of mainstreaming requires a commitment to inclusive practice and, the approach, and the, for these approaches to be effective, the guidance clearly links inclusive practice with the presumption throughout and includes key features of inclusion and guidance on how to include, in, improve inclusive practice in schools. The consultation offers an opportunity to shape the finalised guidance. We will listen carefully and I encourage all those who have a contribution to make to express their views uh, as part of this consultation exercise. In response to the Education and Skills Committee report on additional support for learning, I recognise that the committee wished to act on the evidence that they had heard. I therefore committed to commission independent research into the experiences of children, young people, parents, school staff, including support staff and education authorities and their partners in relation to additional support for learning. I can also announce that this research process will now start and will run concurrently with the consultation on the draft guidance. The intention is to conduct the research in early 2018 and publish a final research report by the end of the summer. Its findings will be used to inform future policy development and reporting so that we continue to renew and refresh our commitment to inclusive education in the future, as we have done throughout this Parliament's lifetime. But there is also work we can do now to improve the experience of inclusive education for children and young people. I've already highlighted, Presiding Officer, the crucial role played by teachers, support staff and other staff in mainstream primary and secondary schools, units and special schools all across Scotland. They are key to ensuring that children and young people's experience of education in the classroom and in the whole school is truly inclusive. They need to know that they have access to resources which support their professional practice and which give them confidence to successfully support children's learning. We therefore intend to work with Education Scotland to develop inclusive education resources to help support head teachers, teachers and support staff in their work and this will be available early in the new year. An inclusive approach to education also requires that each and every child and young person should be involved in their own education and have a voice to shape their experience. They should be provided with the support they need to reach their learning potential. One of the aims of the draft guidance will be to give children's parents and carers their place in the decision-making process. So from January 2018, children who are aged 12 to 15 will be empowered by the extension of their rights in respect of additional support for learning in school education. We will continue to listen to the voices of young people. Our inclusion ambassadors provide a great way for us to do that and responses from the consultation on the guidance and the research will help to further shape our future actions. 
I've set out how far we have come since the establishment of this parliament from the recent past where children were treated in a way that often separated them from their peers and their communities to today where we understand the importance of inclusion for not only children themselves but for the wider community. I have been and continue to be clear that this government's ambition is for all children and young people to be able to reach their full potential including those who experience barriers to their learning and I have restated our commitment to inclusive education. But I know that this is a commitment shared across this chamber. We should not lose sight that, uh, of the fact that not all that we have achieved for children and young people with additional support needs um, has been achieved without listening to each other and indeed learning from each other's perspectives in this debate. I hope the next steps that I've set out today will help us further in our journey towards delivering inclusive education in practice for all children and young people. The education of our children and young people is of paramount importance to us all. We all want children and young people to have equitable access to a quality education which meets their needs and which helps them to achieve their full potential. I move the motion in my name. Thank you very much. I call on Elizabeth to speak to and move the motion in her name. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding, sorry, Presiding Officer. Um, can I say I very much uh, welcome uh, the opportunity to debate this issue and I also warmly welcome the Scottish Government's initiatives uh, that have been announced this afternoon. This is not an easy debate, I think we can all acknowledge that, but nonetheless it's an issue which has huge significance uh, for families across Scotland and not just those uh, with vulnerable children. Uh, there is, as the Cabinet Secretary has rightly said, a historical context to this. Those of us of a certain age remember very well a time when many pupils with very special needs found it very difficult indeed to be seen as deserving of any special focus within their own school or within their own local authority or national government policy. Happily, I think we've come a very long way since that time and I think we should take this opportunity to note at this stage that one of the key attributes of Scottish education that was flagged up by the OECD report uh, was one of uh, very supportive inclusion. I think that's a very important point to remember. And I think we can all agree that inclusion is so important for exactly the reasons that the Cabinet Secretary has set out and that we must do all that we can to ensure that inclusion continues to be a meaningful engagement and experiences in our schools rather than just being on the school role in a mainstream school because I think there's a very important uh, difference there. However, at the same time as there has been a, a lot of uh, very good progress, there has also been increasing complexity and I think it's this complexity which is now challenging us to uh, revisit the policy and I would argue that the following issues have led to some uh, complication. Firstly, and it's a matter that the Cabinet Secretary uh, referred to himself, and especially in the last decade there has been a much better uh, detection of pupils uh, who have specific problems and obviously there's been a huge increase in the number of pupils who have been identified with the ASN, uh, including uh, those that obviously have very uh, complex needs. And that current definition, when it was first used, there were 98,500 pupils were identified uh, with ASN. In the last five years, uh, that's risen by 73% uh, to 170,300. And while I think that it's very good news about the uh, detection level, uh, clearly that uh, puts additional uh, pressure on our schools. Uh, that said, I think there are key issues about the data and how effectively that accurate data is collected and then used in the relevant manner. And we're very conscious of the widespread uh, variation in the count across different local authorities. In North Lanarkshire, for example, just 6% of mainstream school population was identified with ASN, whereas in Aberdeenshire, it was 35%. And that flagged up to me that I think there were differences in approaches, and perhaps that's something that we have to look at in much greater detail, because th that data is obviously crucial to informing uh, policy well. Of course. Cabinet Secretary. I'm grateful to Elizabeth for giving way. For, for completeness in this analysis of statistics, would Elizabeth also accept that within the much expanded range, uh, the most expanded number of young people that are identified with special needs, there is a very broad range of the requirements and support that they would um, require from the very minor level of intervention to a very significant and acute level of intervention to support their needs? Uh, yes, absolutely. And I, and I hope one of the um, progressions that we can make about the accuracy of the data and the relevant application of that is exactly that fact. Um, when we 
uh, first looked at this in the Education Committee, I think there was uh, slightly disturbing differences across local authorities about the interpretation of that. So I think you know, there is very good news on that front. Um, but I think it, it's something that the um, uh, Scottish Children's Services Coalition points to a great deal about the identification of these uh, additional support needs and that that sometimes demands the greater diversity that the Cabinet Secretary is looking for, but it's not always deliverable under the uh, structures that we have within the current uh, local authorities. And they, they make the point that the average local authority spend on AS pupils uh, has fallen by 11% in the same time that that uh, percentage increase uh, has taken place. And um, I had a conversation with uh, Mark MacDonald, uh, the Minister, about the issue of level nine qualifications when it came to looking after some of our uh, vulnerable children. Uh, that was a good conversation and he was very responsive to some issues that I raised back in February about the staffing, the appropriateness of staffing and whether it's always necessary in some cases of additional support to, for learning to have level nine and above. And I hope we can continue that uh, discussion, Minister, because I think that ha does have some effect on the, um, the qualification of our uh, staff, but also on some of the costs that are incurred by some of our uh, special schools. So I hope we can continue uh, that discussion. Then thirdly, I think that there is a huge issue about the financial constraints on councils, which have obviously been uh, combined with teacher shortages, and we should be in no, no doubt whatsoever that that's for some pupils who should be in special schools uh, for very genuine reasons uh, to be uh, mainstreamed perhaps for too long a period. And we can all point to constituents uh, who have uh, these difficulties. Uh, and I do worry uh, of the constituents who come to me sometimes that the, the reason given about where the school uh, is going to make a judgment is taken on a financial basis rather than an educational one. And I think we have to do something to try and uh, reverse that because it's, as the Cabinet Secretary has rightly said, it's about the educational interests of each child that matter so much, uh, not just the uh, financial uh, circumstances. And may I add at some point that I, I, I do think that we have um, some fantastic uh, special schools who are dealing with uh, children who have the greatest uh, complex needs and this is a debate perhaps more for Derek Mackay than it is for education ministers but I think we have to be very careful that we don't penalise them uh, with proposed um, discussions that we're having about business rates because I think the impact of that could be very serious to some uh, special schools and I make a plea on behalf of uh, small independent schools who would feel that very uh, strongly in some cases and um, the cabinet secretary knows some of the schools I'm talking about in uh, Mid-Scotland and Fife who make the point that they may uh, face closure if they were to face uh, these uh, increasing costs. So I think the key issue is to weigh up the overall benefits to the child's education and that child's personal development and the, cu the current legislation which all parties have supported make makes plain that there should be uh, presumption to mainstream. We're very supportive of that uh, and it obviously spells out uh, the three categories where that might not be uh, appropriate. So generally speaking, I think most stakeholders uh, are content, but I think the argument runs that the problem lies not with the legislation so much, but how it is actually interpreted within uh, and across local authorities. And I think perhaps uh, we should take advice from many in the sector, um, people like um, Kenny Graham, who's head of uh, education at Falkland House School. Uh, he, he's, he's flagged up very firmly that he thinks about, it is about the interpretation of the legislation and perhaps the guidance uh, as to uh, how we move forward. And I think within this whole policy area, there's a central dilemma about how to balance the very strong social uh, reasons for keeping a child in mainstream school with the best educational interests of the child. These two do not always fit very neatly uh, together, and neither do the best educational interests of other children uh, within the peer group, especially when I think there's pressure on uh, teaching resources. And a former uh, teacher, I know exactly what some of these pressures uh, can mean and, and some of the emotion that surrounds the decisions that have to be made. Uh, Presiding officer, uh, this is not an easy area of policy and I said at the beginning of my speech, I think it is a critical one when it comes to supporting our young people and ensuring that every one of them is given the support that they need. We should not be misled by the false premise that equity is necessarily complemented by mainstreaming. I was pleased to hear the cabinet secretary endorsing that. Um, because I think it's patently clear that we could do a great, grave disservice to some of our most vulnerable children if we did uh, make that uh, conclusion. So I think the challenge is to restructure 
our resources accordingly. And to that end, uh, we're very happy to uh, support the uh, government motion this afternoon. We're also very happy uh, to support uh, the Labour one. And may I close by moving the amendment in my own name. Thank you very much. And I call Ian Gray to speak to move the motion in his name, amendment in his name. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary is uh, absolutely right to place this consultation today uh, in the development of the policy and legislative framework on disability issues generally and additional needs education specifically across almost 20 years uh, and different administrations. I'm not, honestly not sure how world leading we are in this, but we've certainly come a very uh, long way. When this Parliament began, in 1999, far, far too many of Scotland's disabled people still lived in long-stay hospital-style accommodation, not just excluded from mainstream education, but from the community altogether. It's quite hard to imagine now that that was considered the norm. Um, now, I think the ability to live, participate and learn in the community is a right that I think is supported across this chamber and indeed across uh, wider society. Uh, one of the, the key <clears throat> early moments in this regard, in this parliament, it was the first learning disability strategy uh, and its title in particular, the same as you. For me, that title encapsulates the principle that we strive for. We have to disabuse ourselves of the idea that people with particular needs, physical or otherwise, are asking for something special and extra. The truth is, they want the same things as we all do to live freely, <clears throat> to have every possible chance to make the most of their own lives. Their right to a home, to health care, and yes, to an education is no less valid than anyone else's. And no matter how well we think we have done, we have to acknowledge that we have much further to go, especially in areas perhaps like employment, uh, and yes, in education too. Because a presumption of mainstreaming in schools is exactly where the principle of the same as you takes us in education. But as the Education Secretary, to his credit, says in his introduction to the guidance, the measure of that cannot simply be presence in a mainstream school. It is the opportunities in our schools, not just the desk in the classroom, which we are obliged to open up to all. Now, I've used uh, this example before in debate, uh, but I think it encapsulates uh, a lot uh, about the issue we're discussing. So uh, I do it again. Many years ago, I taught science at Grace Mount Secondary in this city, and it shared a campus in those days with Kames School for the Partially Sighted. The idea was that Kames pupils attended some mainstream classes as well as specialist provision. One of the models, indeed, that Mr. Swinney uh, talked about in his speech today uh, and in the document. So I had, uh, in my science class, one or two pupils with particular needs. In recognition uh, of those circumstances, class sizes were low, 14 or so. Uh, I was able to ensure that I gave the extra support required, and quite often I was supported by a specialist teacher from Cambridge School in my classroom. It was mainstreaming and it worked. And as a teacher, a young teacher starting out, I felt a professional pride in our success. Uh, in the early 80s, though, I spent a couple of years away working abroad. And when I returned, things had changed. As now, it was a time of cuts. Uh, instead of one or two, there were three or four, sometimes five partially sighted pupils in my classes. Those classes were all at maximum class size of 21 uh, for a practical subject. There was no specialist support. The truth was there was no space to give additional, additional needs pupils any additional support at all. They were at a desk in my classroom, but not included in my class. And I felt guilty about that, but, you know, needs must. There was pressure on us, curricular change, new exams, Bigger classes all round. Mainstreaming may be much more mainstream as an idea today, but resources are still at a premium. Since 2010, we've seen a 153% increase in pupils identified as having additional support needs. And that 
can't uh, uh, all be explained by the inclusion of temporary or low-level need uh, in the numbers. And at the same time, ASN support staff have, that's down by 8%, and learning support teachers uh, have dropped by 13%. The Scottish Children's Services Coalition have calculated that spend per pupil on additional support for learning was £4,276 in 2012-13, but only 3,817 in 2015-16. So more need, but less provision. And clearly then, more responsibility for ASL will be falling squarely on uh, teachers in general. But Enable tell us from their surveys that 98% of the education workforce don't feel that teacher training adequately prepares them for that role. So it's 30 years since I failed those partially sighted pupils in Gracemount, but we do seem to be making some of the same mistakes again now. Surely. Mark MacDonald. <coughs> I hear the point Mr Gray is making, but he will also have heard the Deputy First Minister highlighting the significant improvement in outcomes for those children with additional support needs. So when he characterises the concept of failing those pupils, how does he reconcile that with the clear improvement there has been in outcomes for the very children he's describing? Ian Gray. I think that's very much to the credit of our <coughs> teachers and additional support needs workers who remain uh, in, in the system. But we can't ignore the fact, for example, that Enable will tell us that 52% of pupils with learning disabilities don't feel they're getting the right support at school. How they feel about them being, themselves being supported is pretty critical because we cannot, in all conscience, I think, properly rededicate ourselves to the principle of a presumption of mainstreaming uh, or uh, properly endorse the legal framework and administrative framework of delivering inclusion if we're not prepared to acknowledge and face up to the reality of the resource requirements to make this happen properly. <clears throat> because to do so, is to disrespect the everyday lived experience of teachers, parents, and above all, those pupils who say they do not feel that they are receiving the support they need. I don't pretend the resource challenge is easy, not at all, but we cannot pretend that it doesn't exist. And I don't actually think that this is in the end a, a party political point that I'm trying to make. It's almost a, a moral one, an obligation on all of us because if we don't acknowledge the problems, then we're deceiving ourselves about the virtue of our commitment to inclusiveness. If we will, the noble end of the same as you principle, but we're not prepared to will the mundane means to achieve it, then we are simply meeting our own needs to feel that we're doing the right thing while failing thousands of families and children who are looking to us to do the right thing for them to simply, really include them. I move the amendment in my name. We now move to the open debate. Speeches of up to six minutes, please. And I call Jenny Goruth, followed by Tavish Scott. Thank you, presiding officer, and I remind members I am the PLO to the Cabinet Secretary. Um, as we've heard so far today, the presumption of mainstreaming is now well entrained in Scottish educational discourse, but it wasn't always like that. We talked today about putting the child at the centre, but the political and conversely the educational culture wasn't always like that. In my lifetime, teachers were still able to legally belt pupils. In fact, in the last school that I taught in, a framed tause adorned the staff room walls. In emergency, break glass, read the warning below. So when we talk about inclusive education, about meeting the needs of all, we should also be cognizant of the importance of school culture. In terms of exclusion rates, the downwards trajectory is good news. But to my knowledge, the government does not currently gather records of internal exclusions. These are the exclusions which take place under the radar, as it were, sending a pupil out of class um, to the cooler or to the sin bin, as I've heard it called. So I hope that the government will consider directly collecting this data, particularly from our secondary schools, as part of this consultation. I'll give you an example now of a pupil that I taught. In first year, Jamie was the class clown. He mucked about, he got the laughs, he was often sent out. Jamie also had a pretty complex range of additional support needs, but he loved the debating part of modern studies. He was bright and he was switched on. On the writing part, however, Jamie was not convinced. He struggled and he struggled and then he would give up. Jamie's writing capabilities as an S1 pupil were where you'd expect a primary one to be. 
I would do my best as a class teacher uh, with 30 12 year olds in front of me, but it was not easy. The class had a learning support assistant, but there were a number of other children in that class with their own additional support needs. Often I would pass Jamie sitting outside the deputy head's office. He'd have a textbook and a jotter in front of him, doodling away. I'd ask him why he was out of class. Invariably, he'd had a run-in with a teacher. To Jamie, it was a kick to get sent out, to see his classmates' faces light up with glee, to challenge the natural power and balance that exists in a classroom. But he got bored pretty quickly. He'd swing on the plastic chair outside the deputy head's office. This, in turn, would incur the wrath of teachers like me. Heaven forbid he might snap the plastic of the chair. I didn't know much about Jamie's home life situation. That information was not regularly shared with classroom teachers, and it was certainly never shared by email due to its confidential nature. Instead, the gatekeepers of confidential information, the guidance department, would hurriedly ask the staff who taught Jamie to gather around at the end of break for an update. And so it transpired that Jamie's parents had separated. The nature of what had happened meant that Jamie and his siblings couldn't, go, uh, couldn't stay at home anymore, so they were all farmed out. Some to grandparents miles away, some went into care. Teachers were only told about what happened to Jamie four weeks later. So here was this wee 12-year-old boy managing to get himself to class, kicking up for the attention in school which he just wasn't getting at home. And despite the school knowing that Jamie, that Jamie would sit sometimes for weeks on end outside the deputy head's office with his jotter and his textbook doodling away. Deprived of his right to education, not having his additional support needs met. Presiding officer, there wasn't a belt or a, toss in sight, or a set of lines in sight. Nevertheless, Jamie was being punished. The chaos he experienced at home contrasted with his teacher's never-ending desire for order. Jamie, true to his lived experience, kicked back in the only way he knew how. Presiding officer, revisiting the key features of inclusion, it's difficult to see how Jamie was present in his education. Yes, he attended, but he wasn't present in any meaningful sense. He didn't come to the Halloween disco. He didn't take part in the sponsored run. He opted out wherever he could. And more often than not, the school supported him doing so. On Friday last, night, uh, last week, I was privileged to meet with Fraser and Jack, pupils at Star Primary School just outside Mark Kinch in my constituency. Star Primary School is a beautiful Victorian building, but the boys showed me the leaks in the window ledges and they did ask me to raise this directly with the Cabinet Secretary, which I have now done. The boys proudly took me around their school, they showed me where the P1s were taught, they explained to me their models of spaghetti stuck together with marshmallows emulating the engineering of the new Queen's Ferry Crossing. <laughs> they took me to the back field and they explained about all the different shrubs that they planted. Jack and Fraser were totally engaged in their learning. Contrast Jack and Fraser's experience with Jamie. Jamie had lots of different needs. He needed additional support needs. He needed a safe environment to learn in. He needed to be nurtured in a way that secondary schools often don't do. He needed his teachers to have ready access to his confidential information, allowing them to plan lessons and differentiate accordingly. Without that information, Jamie's teachers could not meet his needs. Without it, his teachers came face to face with an angry little boy, and sure enough, he was out the door of most classrooms before he'd even sat down. Presiding officer, I hope the government's consultation into the presumption of mainstreaming will look outside of our educational bubble. We need to look at health and social work and they need to work smarter with our schools and this is particularly the case for children who are at risk. It was the Additional Support for Learning Act which first placed a legal obligation uh, on our educational authorities to identify, provide and review the ASN needs of their pupils. There is now a need for our local authorities, the people who deliver education, to revisit how they meet this requirement. Do they share the information with all staff? Is it available electronically? or do they print it out in a document which is only available to the head of department? Inclusion only works if every part of the system is prepared to talk to and trust each other. Thank you. Tavish Scott, followed by Bob Doris. I'm starting off, so I apologise to you and the Chamber for having to leave early tonight to catch the evening plane uh, home. One of the things I'm doing tomorrow is uh, visiting Sandwich Junior High, at uh, the south end of Shetland uh, with uh, the two MSYPs for our islands. And one of the issues that we want to reflect on is kind of what Jenny Garuth very um, elegantly described there, uh, because the, in addition to doing one of our normal kind of, for want of a bit of a word, surgeries with the senior pupils, uh, I know they want to talk to us about mainstreaming because of this debate in Parliament today. Occasionally I wonder if this place is relevant to, uh, uh, to what goes on in the wider world. But actually, um, two things made me think this week that it absolutely was in the context of today's debate, one of which is, 
is the school getting in touch to say, can you bone up on this so you know what you're talking about tomorrow? And the second is that a teacher, a very old friend of mine who I actually went to school with, who's taught now uh, down here in the mainland of Scotland for years and years and years, phoned me up last night and said, I think there's a debate on mainstreaming in Parliament tomorrow. Uh, and then she gave me this list, and I thought, oh, well, I better do it then um, uh, before the next class reunion. But um, uh, she made a lot of observations, which I recognised in, in Ian Gray's uh, earlier uh, remarks about the reality. I took a lot of what John, John Swinney said, both the context, the international context, the uh, manner in which this parliament uh, addressed this issue, as, as he and Ian Gray and Liz Smith uh, mentioned in their opening uh, points, uh, the manner in which we did it at that time in those early uh, years. Uh, but uh, for the uh, old, very old friend who phoned me last night about it, uh, she said, you've got to just remember the reality of what now happens uh, in the classroom. And the context uh, was that uh, finding staff who are available, experienced and able to hit the ground running in tackling uh, the challenges uh, of mainstreaming, finding time to train staff adequately, making sure that the vast majority of support workers are attached to individuals, because, because that's the reality. And it has consequences, as she put it, uh, for the shared support across classrooms, which is now in her, uh, in her school very limited. And I know that's a, a reality uh, in many, many schools indeed. This affects teachers and indeed, of course, support for other pupils as well. That teachers have never worked harder and neither have learning support workers across uh, schools. But we feel, the, the, the uh, teacher who spoke to me about this last night feels, that we have a reactive system, not effective management of ASN within that main stream. And finally, that accommodation uh, has to be right. Uh, enough space uh, across the school estate or within uh, classes uh, for pupils to have the right access to nurture uh, and for quiet time should they require it, and many, uh, many do. Uh, and I thought that was uh, quite telling in terms of uh, the practical observations of a classroom teacher who's worked in education for a long, long time uh, and who wants this to work, believes in it, absolutely believes in the principles, uh, be but believes that more uh, needs to be done. So in, uh, I too welcome the um, guidance and the consultation and the research that uh, the Cabinet Secretary mentioned in his opening uh, remarks. But the logic for me uh, of that consultation and the logic of what would need to happen as part of that exercise, and I'll be very grateful if, if the government can confirm this is the case, is the recommendation that the Education Committee made in May when we looked at additional support for learning. Uh, uh, and we said at uh, Paris 7, the Scottish Government must also assess the extent to which a lack of resources is impacting on mainstreaming in practice and more generally on the provision of additional support for learning in mainstream education. So I'm with Ian Gray, and this is not a, uh, in many ways a political point, it's a much wider point, that's a better point than just being a political point, because it is about uh, young people and children children who, uh, everyone from John Swinney onwards, recognises that we need to do so much uh, more for. And that was the purpose, and indeed, of many of the recommendations that the Education Committee made uh, back in May across this uh, whole area uh, in recognising that resource limitations are impacting on the processes, which uh, therefore include that the number of trained ASN teachers and ASN assistants, the availability of specialists including mental health specialists and educational psychologists, the level of resources supporting the ASN tribunal process and other appeal processes, and the availability of spaces in special schools, a point that Liz Smith was making uh, earlier uh, on. And I, I would argue that uh, those uh, factors are increasingly important when put in the context of class uh, sizes across uh, Scotland. Again, the government's own statistics perfectly uh, reasonably fairly point out that class sizes in primary schools are rising and by 2015 uh, only 12% of schools had class sizes of 18 or uh, fewer, uh, that there has been a 153% increase since 2010 in students with additional support needs, and that we've got fewer, what, 1,800 or so support staff working in our schools now than we did in 2010. So uh, the context of class sizes, of teacher workload, of teacher shortages, of course, in some areas as well, and then of resources more generally, uh, I think has to be part of the uh, consultation that the Scottish Government have announced today, that the, the assessment of what uh, money means and what money could do uh, to change circumstances that are not working as well as we would all wish them uh, to uh, work, and the need, therefore, for that 
uh, uh, exercise when it concludes uh, to recognize both the importance of the guidance that uh, John Swinney has uh, uh, illustrated today, but the importance, therefore, of what supports that guidance, and that is the practicalities in the, t in the classroom uh, at this time. And I hope that he will uh, undertake to, to uh, do that as part of that exercise, which, which uh, in the context that he described it is very welcome, but I think must address uh, the financial issues as well. Two final points, if I may, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, the Enable report that was produced last uh, month, which other members already uh, highlighted, I do think uh, uh, is an important contribution to uh, this uh, whole area of uh, uh, policy, not least of which because this is Scotland's largest charity for people with disabilities and therefore does and should should be paid uh, significant attention to both in the comments of its executive director uh, uh, just uh, in that report in relation to what is practically happening and the fact that it says uh, in that report that 80% of the education workforce says we are not getting it right for every child. If nothing else, that is the, cl the, the clarion call that should be addressed by the work in this area. Thank you. I call Bob Doris to be followed by Oliver Mundell. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I've got a very strong constituency interest in, in this area and in particular the number of families and constituents working with, particularly uh, at a primary school age and whose children are on the autistic spectrum, the challenges that they have. So in that context, a lot of my comments will be, be made. Um, I was delighted to see at the start of the ministerial forward from the Deputy First Minister that he said we must improve the experience of inclusion for all pupils if we are to deliver on the promise of such an ambitious framework. Being present in a mainstream school should not be the primary marker of successful inclusion. And I think if uh, some parents in Glasgow were asked, they would say that Glasgow has over the years shoehorned children into a mainstream setting rather than finding the most appropriate setting. And I think that's a reasonable thing to say. Um, the Deputy First Minister also says that this is not statutory guidance, uh, but it will present a vision for mainstream, mainstreaming, building on the best available evidence on inclusion approaches to, to education. Absolutely fine, it's not, it won't be statutory guidance, but it will, it will be shaped during this consultation process. But how it's adopted has to be monitored, and depending on that monitoring process, consideration has to be given to put some of it on a, a statutory footing. I think that's a reasonable thing to see, say as well. Now, there's four key principles underpinning the guidance uh, and I'll pick just one of them and it should outline an inclusive approach which identifies and addresses barriers to learning for all children and it's also reasonable to say then that if those principles cannot be lived up to within a mainstream setting we have to reassess the situation so we have to reassess whether that mainstream setting is of course the appropriate setting for that young person in the first place or whether it can be the appropriate setting with additional appropriate supports. We have to identify when that reassessment takes place, who does that reassessment and what criteria should be used. Anecdotally in Glasgow, although not officially, we are told give the kid a year, first year in primary school and we'll see how they get on and then maybe we'll reassess. So much damage can be done to the young people's development if that is what happens uh, and I hope that isn't the case uh, elsewhere. That's what I am told anyway. Now there are a number of key features uh, which, uh, ident which are meant to signify the delivery of the key principles outlined within the document. And again, I'll pick just one, one of those, and it's under how young people are, are supported. And it says all children and young people should be supported to overcome barriers to learning and achieve their full potential. And all children and young people should be given the, ri the right help at the right time from the right people to support their well-being in the right place. Again, it's reasonable to say in Glasgow, if you ask a lot of young people and their parents, they'll say that is not always happening, which I'm delighted actually within the government motion that there's going to be a, a survey and an audit and a consultation done in relation to the lived experience of uh, young people with additional support needs in their families to throw on the, the, the coal face, the real life, the reality of the experience. And that will be vitally important in matching the, the guidance with the reality on the ground. So we do have to look at the types of provision that, that are appropriate. So whether it's the mainstream setting or whether it's a co-location option, it happens quite a lot, or whether it's a standalone specialist unit. Now, in the guidance, um, 
There are some support given to local authorities that they should follow in relation to how they come to that decision. And they call it reflective questioning. And I'll just put some of those reflective questions uh, on the record here. So in, in relation to the support on offer, with the local authorities should be asking questions such as what steps have been taken to make sure the needs of each child or young person have been correctly identified? How are those identified needs being adequately catered for? Uh, would a different provision uh, provide a better outcome for this person or, or other or young people and how could that be achieved? And there's a whole variety of reflective questions there. Again, I wonder how much those types of reflective questions are used, not just in Glasgow, but right across Scotland. So uh, if this guidance and reflective questioning technique is to be meaningful, it has to be consistently applied, I think, across the country. Now, I, I've mentioned that uh, I have a, a number of issues in, in, in my constituency and I'd like to thank families for sharing their stories, stories with me and I've tried to help them where I can along the way and hopefully I've done some of that. We could also thank Colin Crawford, the Head of Inclusion in Glasgow City Council and Andrea Reid from his team who have been very helpful in engaging on the matter also. Now, Glasgow has got 53 uh, units, uh, two assessment centres, a young parent support base at, at Whitehill and two new provisions coming online at Lockend and Govan. 1,700 to 1,800 people, fluctuating slightly uh, ASN provision in Glasgow. It's a huge provision. And I was concerned whether the planning in relation to that provision in terms of uh, the state itself, the workforce, uh, uh, the assessment processes was fit for purpose. And I had a meeting with Colin Crawford and Drea Reid to discuss some, some of those issues. And again, I'd like to thank them for the open and frank conversations that we had. Uh, I think it's reasonable to say that they identify some issues and they've put processes in place to improve matters. And that, that's a good news story. But in relation to the modelling work, in terms of some of that, they mention estate the management, they, they mention support for learning work and allocations, they mention an inclusion group modelling process they have in the city. They mention psychological services, which will come back to presenting officer, and they mention placement management. But it does beg the question, how across all 32 local authorities do we get some consistent modelling work for what this, the SCN estate should look like? Now, I want to make this point in case I'm timed out, presiding officer, because there's something else I really want to say after this, and that is I think the experience of, of, of my constituents is that young people quite often end up in standalone specialist units because the proper support is not put in a mainstream setting, so they demand more. They go to a, they go to a attached unit. The proper support is maybe not put in place, so they eventually end up in a standalone specialist needs setting. I'm never sure whether if the right support had been put in place at mainstream in the first place, if they could have been retained uh, within a mainstream setting. I want to run through a list of things, presiding officer. So this guidance has to have uh, some, some beef in it in relation to, I think, transitions from nursery to primary school, transitions from primary to secondary school. It has to look at the assessment process, it has to look at assessing support in the classroom, it has to look at reviewing placements, it has to look at forward planning, it has to look at estate management, it has to look at the evidence base, including this, I promise you this is the final point, presiding officer, if you're looking at an evidence base as Glasgow does, such as referrals to educational psychologists and speech and language therapists, if you can't get the referral, it doesn't show up on the data, and that's a significant issue as well. Big issues, but huge opportunities, presiding officer. Well, on that final, final, final point, we move to Oliver Mundell, followed by Jackie Bailey. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd have been quite happy uh, on this occasion to give Bob Doris uh, the whole of my six minutes, uh, because I think he's making uh, very much uh, the same points I hear in my constituency mailbag. And I think that there are problems uh, that most uh, members will see across all of our local authorities mm -hmm. in Scotland. Uh, but today we are all uh, united in a common goal uh, of meeting the educational needs of every child in Scotland as best we can, regardless of their ability and whatever support they may need. The intention uh, behind the presumption of mainstreaming is a noble one, and it is meant to establish inclusivity as a default. However, as many others have already stated, inclusivity is far greater than just physically including children with additional support needs in a mainstream classroom setting. And perhaps it's because uh, I'm not of an age when I remember things being all that much different uh, from they are now. But I, I look at this area and I see uh, constituents week in, week out at my surgeries and I hear the battles that their families are facing. And I don't uh, look upon the situation as it is now as being an entirely uh, positive one. 
And I think we do have to remember, and it's not a political point, it's a huge challenge, it's a huge challenge uh, all around uh, the world and no one has all the answers. It's very, very difficult and complex to work out exactly uh, what's best when balancing up uh, some of the different uh, considerations. But there are so many children, and we mustn't forget it, who still don't know what mainstream education is. And in my Dumfries and Galloway constituency, uh, what, what, or constituency that's covered by Dumfries and Galloway council area, I see uh, young people uh, being farmed out across Scotland because uh, the adequate resources are not in place to allow them uh, to go to mainstream or even special schools in the region. Uh, and uh, Cabinet Secretary, there are young people who are being separated from their peers and their communities. And I don't have uh, all the answers or know uh, what to say, uh, but I do see uh, the struggles uh, their families face and the social uh, and economic cost uh, that has for everyone in our society. And I'm also sad uh, to say this. Uh, I was surprised uh, really in 2017 when I reflected on my own feelings uh, of reading Enables included in the main report. I, I was sad and surprised uh, because I wasn't shocked. And I think uh, to be sat here in this parliament uh, in 2017 uh, and, and to read that uh, and, and to accept uh, that uh, all that information's out there, that so many teachers, so many parents, and so many pupils are facing those experiences uh, and uh, that uh, we, we've not found uh, the answers is, is, is very frustrating. And it shows uh, that there's still a very long road ahead in order to ensure full inclusivity uh, and uh, to show that children with additional support uh, can, uh, support needs can actually benefit uh, from mainstreaming. And that report found uh, that more than half of education staff uh, surveyed uh, felt that children with learning disabilities were not involved in as many extracurricular activities, trips uh, and uh, opportunities outside of the classroom as their peers. It also said that two thirds of children uh, with additional support needs were still being bullied in our mainstream schools. Additionally, uh, it said that children uh, with additional support needs uh, might not be being officially excluded from their classroom, uh, but uh, informal inclusion, exclusion uh, was very, very common, uh, with many parents feeling uh, unable to work uh, due to uh, the fear uh, that they were going to be asked uh, to collect uh, their children during the working day. And I must say, in my time as an MSP, one of the saddest uh, things I came across was a family in Annan who told me at a support group uh, that the best day of their child's education was when they were formally excluded from school because that was the very first time that the local authority took their request for additional support seriously. That was the first time the family felt listened to by educational professionals. And I don't think that was through any malice. It was through a lack of resource. It was through those individuals within the education department and the council being overworked. It was through the pressures that teachers were facing in the school that they didn't find the time uh, to give that child the attention they needed. And this adds so much stress for families. It's so unpleasant for them. They're having to fight the system every step of the way. And they're fighting uh, for their children's rights uh, to a very basic level of education. And if we don't do something about this, then it is only going to uh, compound the problems we've seen with the attainment gap in the long run because it's all children in mainstream schools who are suffering uh, when the support isn't there uh, for those who need it the most. On a more positive note, I do welcome uh, the reference uh, made to combining special schools with mainstream ones on, the, on a single site. And I'm very pleased uh, within my own uh, Dumfrieshire constituency to see that happening with Langlands Primary School, uh, which is getting uh, a new building as part of the new learning campus in the town. I think that will make a real difference uh, to those pupils. And I do recognize uh, that there is some progress. It's just that there is far more uh, to do. And we are very lucky, I think, uh, to have had uh, such a great piece of work uh, from Enable. And I'd like to pay tribute very briefly to the Annan and Kirkconnell uh, ACE groups in my constituency who've made such an effort to bring it to my attention. And all I would say is with the survey 
uh, that the government pr has proposed. I hope we're all ready uh, to read the findings of that because I think uh, they will uh, be truly shocking and disappointing uh, and they will demand that we redouble uh, our efforts on a cross-party basis uh, to make sure that we do get things right for every child in Scotland. Thank you. May I have Jackie Bailey followed by George Adam. Presiding officer, I warmly welcome the opportunity to discuss mainstreaming in education in the chamber this afternoon. Um, it was, of course, the Labour Scottish Government that introduced the commitment to inclusive education in 2000, but that was supported across the chamber by all parties. But I also make a declaration of interest, presiding officer, as I am proud to be the convener of the cross-party group on learning disability, which is supported by Enable Scotland. And let me start by paying tribute to Enable Scotland for their report included in the main and for all the work that they do to advance the rights of people with learning disabilities. I very much welcome the consultation on guidance launched by the Cabinet Secretary for Education. This is as a result of one of the recommendations arising from Enable's report, and I welcome his recognition that simply sitting in a classroom doesn't count as inclusion. The report, of course, is a national conversation about life at school. There's no doubt that education for young people with learning disabilities has improved immensely. But it's now 17 years since the presumption to mainstream young people with learning disabilities in education. So we've seen a whole generation of young people go through every stage of education and the report reflecting as it does on their lived experience and that of their parents, care, carers and teachers is very invaluable. What their stories and experience tell us, however, and what we've heard in this chamber is that there is much more to do because we know that for too many young people in our country, inclusive education is still not a reality. Many are still being excluded from classrooms and from opportunities that would enrich their everyday lives. And Enable Scotland's report sets out 22 steps that we can take to make inclusion in education the standard for all Scotland's young people. But in the time available, I want to focus on just a couple of areas. Firstly, the need for specialist staff. The research shows us that 98% of teachers feel that they are not adequately prepared. That's a stunning total. 86% said there's not enough additional support for learning staff in their schools to support young people with learning disabilities. And a substantial 80% of education staff say that they were simply not getting it right for every child. And whilst I will always welcome new strategies and good intentions, we need to recognise that the guidance will struggle to make an impact if we're faced with cuts to education budgets. And I've had many cases of parents and teachers complaining about the real lack of support in the classroom which has had an impact on their children. That's their lived experience. And there have been cuts. The number of children with additional support needs has increased by 153% since 2010. Many of these pupils coming from a lower income household and an area of deprivation. And since 2010, one in seven ASN teaching posts have been cut. So numbers of children are increasing, but teaching posts are reducing. We know in the last decade, there are 4,000 fewer teachers, 1,000 fewer support staff, and critically 500 fewer additional support needs specialists. Spending per pupil, in Scotland has fallen cumulatively by over one billion. That's a reduction in real terms of 489 pounds per head at primary level and 152 pounds per head at secondary level. So let me say as gently as I can, we all want this to work, but it won't work unless there are more resources. And I don't mean just generally, quite specific, quite targeted resources to go hand in hand with the guidance which will be good and will make a difference. The education workforce is of course central to that success. Enable Scotland itself has called for renewed investment in the role of additional support for learning teachers. That's essential. We need to ensure that that specialist resource is regularly available to all education staff. Now I want inclusive education embedded into every part of the curriculum and the guidance will help that. But we must ensure that the specialist teaching resource is in place to support that too. Having training and employment for specialist support teachers themselves matters as well. 
That will benefit not only the pupils who rely on that kind of support at school, but the teachers and education staff who are routinely put under pressure at work, many of them feeling stressed and anxious due to not having the right support to meet the needs of children and young people with learning disabilities. The need for additional support for learning teachers was highlighted by people in my own constituency as part of Enable Scotland's national conversation. And I want to draw attention to two particular responses, one from a parent in Western Bartonshire, the other from a teacher in Argyll and Butte. Both of them, from their different perspectives, stated that they did not believe that proper support for children and young people with learning disabilities was in place. The teacher highlighted that in Argyll and Butte, all the training for additional support needs had been organised privately and that the local authority had provided no support whatsoever. That's clearly disappointing. Now, I wholeheartedly agree with many of the points made by Bob Doris. It might surprise him that I do so, but I thought he made an excellent speech. And I agree that at the end of the day, we can do better. We must do better because we owe it to future generations of young people with learning disabilities. The guidance will be a good start but we need the additional specialist staff to support its implementation. I commend all the recommendations in Enable's report to the Scottish Government, and I promise that the Cross-Party Group on Learning Disability will continue to be a critical but encouraging friend on this journey towards genuine inclusion in our schools. Thank you. I call George Adam to be followed by Jeremy Balfour. Thank you, President Officer. I'm glad to be part of this debate for a number of reasons that will become uh, relevant as I progress. But to begin with, I'm pleased to hear from the Deputy First Minister that those with uh, learning difficulties, their outcomes have improved. But I also agree with Ian Gray, where, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing him here when he says that we've been in a long journey in this Parliament and it's an issue that we can always look for improvement. But it was also interesting to hear from Jenny Glorutham saying from a professional point of view of what happens in their schools as well. Because I know it's a very emotional issue this for families whose children are, going, are affected by learning difficulties and what they're going through. My constituency, I constantly hear about uh, families that their children either haven't been diagnosed or they aren't going through the process or they're in the process and they're not getting the support they have. And I hope that the guidance, and it looks like from reading it, the guidance will help with that as well. But I'm aware the presumption for mainstreaming has been a core of the Parliament's inclusive education since 2000. And I'm aware, presiding officer, for this for a number of reasons. Uh, someone who's not just someone who's been involved with politics for a very long time, but my awareness comes from the fact that my son James went through the educational system before this Parliament was reconvened. And Oliver Mandel, I can tell him I am that old. I do remember what it was like beforehand. You know, but James struggled with primary school right from the very beginning. And it took a while for teachers and everyone else to try and find out what the issue was. He was a bright wee boy. He was talented. He asked all the questions. When he found out what why was, uh, that kind of became very difficult with any other parent to uh, get all the questions. Specifically when he says, why are we sit month supporters? Why do we do this? Why do we do that? But no one... Uh, <laughs> That was a difficult one for me to answer, actually. Uh, but no one, no one actually, but no one knew what was wrong with James. Uh, and at some point, some of the teachers actually treated him with uh, less than professional attitude in his assessment of him. He was thought of as a child that was just never going to be able to catch on and move forward in school. And by the time he was heading to primary three, he was diagnosed with dyspraxia. And uh, the education authorities decided it would be a good idea to have him in the local special school. Now, my whole argument was then, and it is now, that I don't believe that was the best way forward for my son in that scenario. And we made that argument at the time, but we never had the processes that are available to parents here and the guidances that are available to uh, local authorities. And it was more or less uh, made a situation where James ended up, by the time there, he had no confidence, he'd lost faith in the educational establishment. And that's why I'm glad that we're in a position now where we're all standing here agreeing that we know this is the way forward. It's just making sure that we get it right. Uh, and uh, the whole idea is, uh, you know, when, when James, in our scenario, went to the anything like a football boys club and everybody asked what school he was in, there was a whole embarrassment of he went to a different school from them and it was the special school he went to. And, and that caused all kinds of problems. Until to this day, if he was honest, he'd probably kill me if he ever sees this and I've mentioned it. But if he was honest with himself, that affected him to this actual time. And the Scottish Government's uh, policy is that children and young people should learn in the environment that best suits their need. 
And if my son had had that support, it could have made the difference because the problem became uh, James uh, actually started to become himself. It was the low esteem in himself and his achievements. He couldn't feel as if he was doing anything that was of any value to anyone, no matter what love and affection and support his family and friends gave him. Even with, all, even with all that, he still had difficulty. But I think we must remain on focus what is good about the presumption of mainstreaming. I know it's challenging, but I don't want anyone else's child to go through what my own son did. I'm particularly pleased with some of the new guidance the Scottish Government will introduce and the fact that the education authorities must identify, provide and review the additional support their pupils need to overcome the barriers to learning. The guidance itself aims to bridge the gap between legislation, policy and day-to-day -day experience to ensure that local authorities have the guidance required to help in their decision making and applying the presumption of mainstreaming. And I'm aware of the difficulties, but we need to ensure that young men and women get that support at the time when they actually need it. But 95% of children currently with additional support needs are educated in mainstream schools. If only they'd had that back in the day, I believe that all our teachers offer the kind of support that our children and young people need. They are the ones that can be that person for the young person to go to. They are the ones that offer that kind of way forward for our young people to be ambitious and try and achieve all they can. But they provide that support and they should help all the children and young people to reach their full potential. And one of the many things that we found during our time was that well, even though when James went to the special school himself, it was a fantastic school and it offered so much, but it wasn't right for him and it wasn't the right place where he should have been. And I think that's what we are looking at now. We have a system where we are looking to, to try and ensure, to ensure that we get our children to the right place at the right time. So, presiding officer, many young people went through the system that did not take into account their needs. My son, James, has been one. And since the Parliament came into being, the presumption of mainstreaming has been a key part of our educational policy. And we must ensure we continue to develop this policy further, and as Ian Gray says, constantly improve it and ensure that we can do better, so that all our, young ch all our children and young people get the start that every single one of them deserve. Call Jeremy Balfour to be followed by Graham Day. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Deputy Presiding Officer, you will find this hard to believe, uh, but I started uh, school in 1972, and yes, the years have been kind. Uh, I was very fortunate, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, that uh, where we were lived here in Edinburgh became the centre. Uh, for many people from Scotland and the north of England uh, who had upper and lower limb. And the PMR set up a special sentence. So over the holiday period, many of us uh, got together to get extra help that was required. Looking back, I think I was the only child of that age that went to mainstream school. Everyone else went to uh, a special needs school. Now, I was very fortunate. My parents chose to mainstream me, and I had fortunate to go to an independent school here in Edinburgh. But I think we do have to set this debate in that historical context, that how far we have come as civic society, um, as politicians, as educationists. And I think uh, there are many lessons that we need to learn, and many of them have been highlighted by others today. But we have come a long way. And I think we need to be encouraged by that and say, yes, we are on a journey, and the journey has taken us so far, and we need to go further. In the time I have uh, this afternoon, I would just like to make two points about this. I think the Deputy First Minister picked this up in his speech, and I was grateful that he did, that when we talk about mainstreaming and education, we're not simply talking about what happens in the classroom in regard to lessons. Uh, too often we concentrate on have we got the right provision when they're in English or maths or whatever. And that is vitally important and we shouldn't play that down. But if we see inclusion as somebody who is isolated for the rest of their school experience, then we are missing the point. What happens in the playground is probably as important, if not more important, than what happens in a primary school lesson. What happens and how a child is treated in the lunchroom or the dining room 
is as important as is what happens in the classroom. How we treat children in regard to PE and other activities, again, is really important. And I think we've got lots of teachers who are able to think outside the box when it comes to these activities. Again, picking up on my own personal experience, uh, because I was unable to, to participate in uh, football or rugby or cricket as a player, the school realised that I would be able to umpire, touch judge, score the cricket match. So to be included in a way that I was able to benefit from and build those friendships. And sometimes I think we do need to give head teachers, we need you to give teachers that room to be able to uh, be able to think outside what we can normally do so that a child feels always included. Can I, can I fully agree with the comments made by Jackie Bailey and by Tara Scott in regard to the support we need to give our teachers and support teachers around that? The final point uh, I would like to make, uh, Deputy President Officer, is in regard to postcode lottery, or perhaps to put it another way, parent code lottery. Because although we see the presumption is for mainstreaming, we also, and I think the Scottish Government agree, that for some children, their best interests will not be served in a mainstream, but we will be served in a school that meets their needs in certain different ways. But what surprised me, both as a, a local councillor previously here in Edinburgh City Council, and also in the uh, post bag in regard to being a regional MSP, is that those that want to choose for their children not to be mainstreamed, but to go to a different type of school, if they shout loudest, if, let's be honest, our middle class are far more likely to get a place in that school than others from the rest of our society. And I do think there's a challenge for local authorities, for us as politicians, that we make sure that those who come from vulnerable backgrounds, whether it's economic or educational or, or family, have the same opportunities as those like myself who come from a privileged middle-class background. I also think we have to say and be very careful that we do treat every child as an individual. And yes, we have a presumption of mainstreaming and, and that I support fully and benefited from that. But there will be times when it's not right for a child to be mainstreamed. And we have to, as uh, my colleague Lynn Smith said, make sure that we protect those schools that are providing those excellent services, are both financially and also in regard to the way to we speak about them, protected in the right way. I also want to thank Enable for their report, for the work that they are doing around this area. And I think this has been a very positive debate. I think there is agreement. And I would encourage us all that we are on a journey and we are maybe halfway there and we need to keep going cross-party-wise. Thank you. Call Graham Day, followed by Ross Greer. Thank officer, thank you. Um, in March of this year, I led members' business on the subject of the presumption of mainstreaming as it was addressed in the excellent Enable Scotland report included in the main. It's a measure of the importance placed on the subject by members of this chamber that by the time seven MSPs had signed my motion, every party in this parliament had been accounted for. So I therefore warmly welcome this further opportunity to debate mainstreaming, and more importantly, the release of excellence and equity for all, which for me really does move this discussion on. I'm sure Enable Scotland will be heartened to see the new guidance acknowledging in a general sense the validity of their concerns. As the introduction to the guidance states, and I quote, at present, despite the strength of the legislative and policy basis and the ambitious vision for all children and young people, more needs to be done and more can be done to get it right for every child and ensure that they are all experiencing equity and excellence. Let me, as I did in March, declare an interest. My wife is a member of a hard-pressed additional support team in a secondary school. But my passion for this subject, and I know I'm not alone amongst MSP colleagues in this, is fired more so by experience of constituency casework. I support entirely the presumption in favour of mainstreaming, but the way in which it's been interpreted and implemented by some local authorities absolutely needs looked at. And this document, 
the consultation and accompanying research opens the door to doing just that. Let me focus on two specific points covered in the guidance which have one thing in common, the fact that they in some instances are currently being approached in anything but the way the guidance anticipates. Bullet point 32 addresses a situation where it may be necessary to look to alternatives to mainstream settings for a child or young person because their behavioural issues, for example, are such they would not benefit from being in that environment and or the education of other children could, would be impacted. In reality, I would suggest that other than in the most extreme circumstances, pupils who are disruptive are being placed into mainstream environments, albeit perhaps catered for some of or all of the time in learning support basis, with little real regard for their impact on others, and it's left to already hard-pressed staff to manage the situation as best they can. Bullet point 33 covers unreasonable public expenditure, and each local authority having to consider what a reasonable level of public expenditure is within the context of their commitments. It focuses on where the cost of adapting a school environment to support one young person is prohibitive, and accepts in such a case, then perhaps alternative provision can be considered. But again, does that reflect how things are playing out currently, especially when an authority has few, if any, special schools at its disposal? Is it not all too often the case that rather than source or fund a relatively expensive specialist placement, some councils will persuade parents that they can, can accommodate their child within supported mainstream provision and in practice very often without then actually providing the additional resources required to meet that pupil's need and risking diminishing support for others. Excellence and equity for all and the consultation around it has the potential to challenge and change this approach where it exists. As Liz Smith indicated, this is not an easy subject to consider, certainly with complete candour. For example, medical advances made since 2000 mean that we have children with very complex needs being catered for in mainstream school settings in a way that almost certainly was not envisaged 17 years ago, and with all the impact that has on resources and indeed on the support being offered to other ASN youngsters. And sitting alongside that are the expectation levels of some parents unreasonable expectation in some cases when you look at this dispassionately, yet understandably, uh, and understandably so if you put yourself in their shoes. And yet whilst I have in relation to case work come across such situations, I've been struck far more by instances where the system as delivered is letting families down. And so often that's happening for avoidable reasons, which have less to do with finances and more to do with lack of service cohesion or sadly grasp of need. Illustrating that latter point, let me highlight a case I noted in the members' debate concerning my, a teenage constituent with complex needs who had been unable to attend a local secondary school uh, base for some months. Ahead of an effort to try and reintegrate her, her mum was invited to visit the newly refurbished base facilities, which she'd been told would be an asset in catering for the daughter, who is, amongst other things, autistic. However, the mum told me the brand new sensory room's colour scheme was not autism friendly, it was tiny. And the soundproofing was so inadequate that sitting in it, she could hear the kids passing in the adjoining corridor. Ultimately, that case had a welcome outcome, as have others I've been involved in. But the stress for all concerned over many, many months was entirely avoidable. And that isn't a unique experience, as the Enable report laid bare. When parents and carers were asked to describe their experience of the school system, 67% used the word battle, 77% used the word stressful, 44% used the word alone. But I want to finish on a couple of optimistic notes. Firstly, as we're hearing this afternoon, the publication of Excellence for All has reignited the debate around what the presumption in favour of mainstream uh, is. And that's a good thing. And hopefully the measured, constructive tone being taken here today is the shape of things to come as we move forward. Secondly, I have, admittedly with mixed success, sought to engage with secondary schools in my constituency around how they intend to deploy the pupil, uh, pupil equity fund monies coming their way. To be honest, I was a little bit worried that in spending it, many ASN pupils would be forgotten or their interest pushed to the bottom. What I've found has been the reverse. The, those schools are working with cluster primaries in a way which, amongst other things, gives rise to hope that the needs of all youngsters will be identified early and hopefully met as they progress through their educational journey. That's the needs of all youngsters. PEF has the potential to change things for the better. So too does this guidance and the accompanying research. Presiding officer. I call Ross Greer to be followed by John Mason. Thank you, presiding officer. 
Delivering an inclusive educational environment for all speaks directly to the kind of society that we aspire to be. As others, including Jenny Ruth and Ian Gray, have said, for far too long, young people with additional needs have suffered exclusion from education and from society as a whole. Ensuring access to mainstream schools has been a, a central demand of the movement for equality for disabled people in the UK and indeed globally for quite some time. The right to participate in mainstream education is now enshrined in Article 24 of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. It sets out that individuals must not be excluded from the general education system on the basis of a disability and that they must be able to access inclusive and quality education on an equal basis with others. The standards in Scotland Schools Act from 2000, which has been mentioned, um, sought to put this right into domestic law by introducing the presumption to mainstream. This means that the default option for all is a mainstream school, ensuring that young people with disabilities and with other additional needs have that access to a mainstream education. It does not, however, mean that the education is automatically inclusive. Mainstream education is not the same as inclusive education. It is, it can be, it should be a gateway to an inclusive education, however. But often the reality for young people with additional needs in mainstream schools is far from inclusive. Since 2010, education spending in Scotland has dropped by about 4.3% in real terms. That means around £490 spent less per primary school pupil each year, £150 less per secondary pupil. It's led to over 500 fewer specialist additional support needs teachers and a loss of around 1 in 10 additional support needs support staff. And this is at a time when we're identifying more additional support needs amongst pupils, now totaling some one in four. Though, as Liz Smith notes, there are issues in the consistency of identification which we certainly need to address. I look at examples of North Lanarkshire, which was mentioned at, with an identification rate of around six or seven percent, compared to Western Bartonshire, where it's over one in three children. Demographically, very similar areas, children from very similar backgrounds, and quite a significant difference there. But this has heaped significant additional pressures on existing teachers, leading to a decline in their working conditions. A recent report by Bath Spa University that's been mentioned a number of times in this chamber in recent weeks described working conditions in Scottish schools as being extremely poor at present. Teachers have less time to spend with each pupil. With the loss of specialist ASN teachers, the expertise necessary to help some pupils is being lost. In Able Scotland, who have quite rightly been praised by, I think, almost every speaker in the debate so far, uh, found that the vast majority of the education workforce, teachers and support staff, do not feel that teacher training and other training has adequately prepared them to teach young people or to support those young people with learning disabilities. And there is a lack of support uh, for staff to do that. This has left more than half of children and young people with a learning disability feeling that they do not get the right support in school. Pupils are attending mainstream schools, but they are excluded. Whether it's informal exclusion from class, not being able to take part in school trips, not being able to participate in sporting activities, that exclusion is real. Like others here, I spend a significant amount of my time now speaking to teachers. They're working incredibly hard under very difficult conditions to provide an inclusive learning environment. But they are being let down as austerity takes hold in Scottish schools. The challenges here are significant. It is already difficult to provide high quality training to new teachers undergoing their initial teacher education. One year, as is the case for most uh, teachers, is not enough to become an expert on such a vast range of additional needs. Speaking to trainee teachers, I've heard how education on additional support needs can vary quite significantly across different university courses. Some are excellent and comprehensive, prepare them well for the classroom, Others, unfortunately, fall short, and many are, are somewhere in the middle. And a lot of training on additional support needs, of course, takes place in schools. But it's significantly dependent on being placed with a teacher who has both the relevant experience and knowledge themselves and the capacity. If a trainee teacher is placed with uh, an existing teacher who's already overburdened, already struggling with poor working conditions, or who themselves uh, do not have the relevant experience or knowledge, then those skills are not being passed on, and young people are suffering as a result. I very much welcome the government's commitment to working with the General Teaching Council and Education Scotland on additional uh, needs in teacher training, on undertaking further research on the experiences of pupils with additional needs and on developing resources, further resources for staff. And I look forward to receiving further details on the actions the government intend to take in this regard. With many new teachers undergoing that one year course, it is vitally important that further training opportunities are available. 
As I said, initial teacher education can often only provide a baseline of experience on additional needs. It is through continued professional development that teachers have the opportunity to enhance their ability to support pupils. But with such high workload pressures as a result of staff shortages, teachers often do not have the time they need to engage in that further training, and austerity has led to the erosion quite directly of CPD budgets themselves. Presiding officer, updating the guidance on the presumption of mainstreaming is a welcome step. The last guidance was issued some time ago. I think I was still at the infant end of my primary school at the time. But the situation, as well as our understanding, has moved on considerably since then. So this is a, a welcome uh, and necessary step. But we cannot pretend that new guidance, or even the, the policy in itself, is enough to create an inclusive learning environment for all pupils in Scotland. And from this debate, I'm reassured that we clearly, on a cross-party basis, do not kid ourselves in that regard. The government is committed to the principle of inclusive education. Of that, I have absolutely no doubt. But they must get to grips with the issues preventing that in practice. It's not enough to provide targeted pupil equity funding, for example, though as Graeme Day uh, made the point very well, it is absolutely welcome and it is making a difference. What is required, though, is reversing damage of the last decade, allowing councils and schools to deliver the support that young people with additional needs require. That means a fair funding package for our local councils and exploring other levers which ensure that the right priority is being given to additional support needs provision in mainstream schools. The inspection regime, for example, does not, I believe, place sufficient emphasis on assessing this. With some adjustment, this could be a powerful tool in ensuring that the correct priority is given to the inclusion agenda. If we are to really, in the words of the Scottish Government, bridge the gap between legislation, policy and the practical experience of children, young people and their families, then we really must address the funding issue with some urgency. Only then can we ensure that all young people in Scotland, whatever their needs, can reach their full potential. I call John Mason to be followed by Monica Lennon. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I'm very pleased to be able to take part in this uh, debate this afternoon as presumption of mainstreaming has been a topic which has come up a fair number of times, I have to say, in my constituency with constituents. Particularly, I would say, in relation to children on the autistic spectrum. And I've had quite a number of cases where the parents and the nursery school, in fact, both felt that mainstream primary one was not going to work for their child, but Glasgow City Council has insisted on mainstream, as I think Bob Doris was saying as well. I do think this uh, guidance or draft guidance produced uh, is broadly good and weighs up the different factors which have been raised with me. For example, the four key features of being present, participating, achieving and supported in paragraph four. I think when I was younger, many young people with additional needs were hidden away in places like Lennox Castle near Glasgow and some of the rest of us used to visit them uh, once in a while. So the fact that we now have a much more mixed cohort all present together in a mainstream school in itself is a major improvement. But sometimes we have to ask ourselves, as others have mentioned this afternoon, how well some of the kids are really participating. There is certainly a concern from some parents that their children are not getting the individual support they need in the mainstream school, perhaps because of lack of staff. Yet I do accept that some parents I have met can be overly protective of their kids and the point is made in paragraph 48 that we need to retain high expectations for all of our children and young people and that means sometimes pushing them out of their comfort zones. The example given at that part of the guidance is Cardinal Winning Secondary School which is in my own constituency and I have to say I think very highly of them and I think the community does as well. But the process of taking kids out of their comfort zone can be expensive in terms of staff time and therefore money. A good example of this uh, I saw a few years ago when I visited Falkland House School in Fife, which Liz Smith has already uh, referred to. They focus on boys with autism, and one thing they did was to have a number of the youngsters apply for a real job, which was, I think, cutting grass around the school. And of course, some of them did not get the job, and being autistic were frankly distraught uh, at the end of that. But this was a learning experience for these young people so that they would be able to handle setbacks in the future. However, I just do not think many schools could have done that as it is so resource intensive. And it was apparently the case at Falkland that virtually all the boys were from families with educated and better off parents who had pushed and pushed for this provision, a point that Jeremy Balfour has made. There was only one child from uh, Glasgow there and I do not believe 
only one child from Glasgow needed that provision. That has also been the experience I've seen with friends of mine, where parents who are more able to challenge their council have achieved better outcomes for their children. The guidance is also open about this issue, which is good. Uh, the example at paragraph 59 is New Stevenson Primary, where apparently, quote, some parents feel they had to fight to get a placement, unquote. So if I have a question for the Cabinet Secretary this afternoon, it's the same one I think that Jeremy Balfour asked, is how do we ensure that youngsters whose parents are less able, or frankly less combative, get the most suitable provision for them? If any of that sounds a bit critical of local authorities, and especially Glasgow in my case, I'd also want to say how much good I've seen in the Glasgow system. One of the big advantages of having schools run by the council is that the expertise and support on specialist issues can be shared across the schools, and there is a scale in Glasgow that can provide special schools and also support to mainstream schools. To change tack slightly, I would also like to mention the Islands Bill at this stage. Now, that might seem a little bit off the subject, or the immediate subject. However, I am a member of the REC committee, and we have been doing a fairly thorough job on this bill, having visited quite a number of islands. One of the subjects in it is the island's impact assessment, which would mean that any policy or guidance, like this one, needs to be considered as to how it would impact on island communities. So I was looking at the guidance to see if there was an island's perspective on it. I was interested in paragraph 21, which suggests that pupil att might attend two separate schools. Now that might be fairly easy in a city, but it's certainly much more challenging on an island situation. However, I have to th say I thought paragraph 26 was extremely good, as accepting as it does that, quote, local circumstances can be very different, unquote, and that the guidance does not over-prescribe. I think this is the kind of flexibility that the islands are looking for, but no doubt we'll hear from them if it is not. Moving on to the amendments, I was glad to see in both the Conservative and Labour amendments a recognition that there is an increasing number of children with additional support needs that it would be a challenge at any time to cope with, and especially when finances are tight. I myself am very open to some tax increases, assuming we will actually get more money from that, and it will not just lead to widespread avoidance. But even with increased revenue through taxation, resources will still be tight, and we will not be able to do all that we would like to do. So I hope there will be recognition across the chamber that we all need to prioritize and no one will get all they want. Finally, I thought the point made in paragraph 29 was worth emphasizing. We want our young people both to meet learning targets and to have a full experience of school life. Again, Jeremy Balfour talked about that. Gone are the days when academic results are the be all and end all. I met University of Scotland this morning and they made the point that employers are looking for graduates who are rounded and ready to start work and not just those who are most academically able. So for all our children, we want the best possible outcomes, and I'm happy to commend these guidelines and the motion to that end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mason. I call Monica Lennon to be followed by Ruth McGuire. And you've got sort of an extra 30 seconds, 40 seconds on. Isn't that exciting? You've made my day, <laughs> sir. Thank you. Like many MSPs across Parliament, I've been raising concerns with the Scottish Government about the declining numbers of additional support needs teaching posts at a time when the number of identified pupils with additional support needs has rocketed. Each time I've raised this, the Scottish Government has provided explanations for why this has happened, including the reason that the way in which additional support needs are defined and recorded has broadened over the years. I do not dismiss that explanation behind the dramatic rise in the number of ASN pupils in our schools since 2010. But I hope we can all agree that that does not answer why um, one in seven ASN posts have indeed been cut from Scotland's schools since 2010. And I hope we all recognise that it's not any comfort to families who are struggling daily to access the necessary support. It has been re reassuring to hear colleagues from right across the chamber today reiterate support for the presumption of mainstreaming and for inclusion in the education system. On the principles of the issue, there is no disagreement. Liz Smith, Ian Gray, Jenny Gilruth, three different teachers from three different parties, but they've all brought reality 
from the classroom to the, the chamber. And from all the contributions, which I think have been very thoughtful, it's clear that we all want to see a significant improvement in outcomes and less stress on the shoulders of hardworking staff. But it's not our words, as nice though they are, that will make the difference. It is action that is needed. So like others, I welcome the fact that the Scottish Government have today published a consultation on updated guidance for the presumption of mainstreaming. But I do remain to be convinced that the content of this updated guidance will bring about the change that we need right across Scotland, all the improvements that we want to see. Because, for example, there doesn't appear to be a, an extra, a single extra penny identified to provide more support for our young people. So without resources to back up the sentiments, it is difficult to see how progress will begin. I am, however, encouraged to see the commitment from the Cabinet Secretary in the publication of the consultation, if I quote directly, that we must improve the experience of inclusion for all pupils if we are to deliver on the promise of such an, amb an ambitious framework. Being present in a mainstream school should not be the primary marker of successful inclusion. I agree with that sentiment wholeheartedly and believe it strikes at the root of the concerns of many parents and carers whose children with additional needs are in mainstream education. As has already been pointed out during the course of this debate, the Education and Skills Committee report into ASN is clear in its analysis. And again, to quote directly, the evidence points at a number of ways in which resources are not currently sufficient to support those with additional support needs in mainstream schools. The most notable factors are the reduction in the number of specialist staff in classrooms, the reduction in special support services and the reduction in special school places. The experts are clear that improving the experience of inclusion therefore will require a significant investment in resources alongside revision of the guidance. I've made some scribbles here but I think it was, yes it was the IS General Secretary Larry Flanagan who said that that cutbacks mean that some ASN teachers fear that inclusive education is being done on the cheap. Mainstreaming, as it currently stands, is failing too many of our young people. I was particularly struck by the briefings for today's debate by Inclusion and Enable Scotland, which in part so powerfully demonstrate the reality for our ASN young people. For example, where we have deaf or disabled pupils in mainstream schools who cannot fully participate in extracurricular events like school trips or break activities because of inadequate provision of support, then we don't have adequate inclusion, but we have further segregation and isolation. On the substance of what action should be taken to improve the guidance and practice of the presumption of mainstreaming, there are two points I want to, to reinforce, like others have already done so and I hope they'll be taken on board as part of this process. Firstly, as has been highlighted to us by Enable, is taking urgent action to stop the practice of exclusion. The consequence of strained budgets and classroom resources means that types of informal exclusion, particularly for children with learning difficulties, whereby these young people are removed from the classroom, can be used as an inappropriate measure of resolving issues. And I'm sure that the Cabinet Secretary and the Ministers will take away with them the, the example, the story that Jenny Gilruff shared about, about her pupil, Jamie. And it's vital that the updated guidance will address the point of exclusion explicitly and make clear that exclusions from school which are not properly recorded and justified are unlawful and that that practice cannot be allowed to continue. Secondly, there is the wider point which needs to be addressed around prejudice-based bullying. It's currently the case that there is no statutory duty for schools or local authorities to record incidents of bullying. Oliver Mundell made the point that disabled children are at a heightened risk of being subject to long-term bullying at school, yet we have no adequate mechanisms to identify and record this type of prejudice-based harassment. In closing, presiding officer, I'm pleased to have had the chance to contribute some thoughts on this important subject today. We are all agreed that the presumption of mainstreaming must be supported, but it's time to match words with actions and give all our additional support needs young people the resources and the support they need for an inclusive education.
Thank you very much, Ms Lennon. I call Ruth McGuire to be followed by Annie Wells. Ms McGuire, you also have a little extra time. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I think the commitment of this Parliament to delivering inclusive education is not in doubt. However, as MSPs and as parents, friends and family members, we're all aware of the challenges when it comes to delivering truly inclusive education and practice. I'm aware of some local concerns around things such as Education Scotland guidance not making reference to additional support needs. And we're all familiar with Enable Scotland's included in the main report, as well as that of the Education Committee from earlier this year, both of which set out the many concerns that need to be addressed if we are to improve the experience of inclus inclusive education for pupils, families and teachers. We've rightfully heard many of these concerns reiterated and underlined in today's debate. The Scottish Government is clearly listening and taking these seriously. I welcome the forthcoming research it's commissioned, as well as the revised guidance which has just been published and which will now be consulted on. Together with the results of the research, the consultation responses will feed into the final revised guidance, which I trust will address a lot of the current concerns. I'd like to use this opportunity to provide some of my own feedback on the revised guidance by focusing on the importance of inclusive play and nurture to the experience of children with additional needs at school. Firstly, the guidance under the heading of participating states that all children and young people will have the opportunity to participate and engage as fully as possible in all aspects of school life, including school trips and extracurricular activity. This, of course, includes a child's right to play, something which is crucial to all aspects of a child's development, social, emotional, intellectual and physical. The right of a child to play is unequivocally recognised in the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, which, of course, also forms the legal basis for the provision of inclusive education in general. It's also recognised in the Play Strategy, published by this government in 2013, which affirms a commitment to enabling all children to realise their right to play. In this context, it should concern us all that nearly half of the children and young people with learning disabilities who took part in the Enable Scotland research reported that they don't get the same chances to take part in games in the playground as everyone else in their school. Similarly, a key finding of the 2015 review of inclusive play in Scotland was that disabled children face multiple barriers to being able to play at school. In order to enable the all children to fulfil their right to play and to ensure that all children are included in all aspects of school life, it's clear that the provision of inclusive play must be improved. And where there are financial pressures, um, the good news is that inclusive play can be provided through quite simple, low cost and low key measures. For example, one of the main barriers cited to inclusive play is inflexible playground rules, such as upper age limits on activities or areas which exclude children who might still benefit from activities aimed at younger children or who have friends in younger classes. Changes to rules like these could be made sensibly and sensitively to facilitate more inclusive play. Others have reported adapting games, for example, by having basketball posts at different levels within a game so that all children can take part and play together. Another straightforward and uncostly way to remove barriers. Another of the main issues when it comes to inclusive play is a lack of general awareness or confidence amongst teachers around the value of play or how to provide play opportunities. I note that the improved initial teacher training and CPD relating to children with additional needs, support needs are key recommendations of both the Education Committee report and the Enable report. And I hope that education around the importance of play provision and in particular inclusive play can be introduced to this discussion. In particular, making sure that teachers are aware of the many high quality and free resources that are there to support. For example, the Play Toolkit recently launched by Play Scotland, an invaluable resource which clearly delineates the 16 recognised types of play, the different benefits they bring and how to facilitate them. Given the importance of play to all children, as well as the particular concerns that have been raised around inclusive play provision, it would be good to see some reference to play in the delivering inclusion section of the final guidance. Many in the chamber, not least of those, who those of us who spoke in the Bernardo's Nurture Week debate back in February, will also be aware of the positive and tangible effects of nurture groups on attainment and inclusion. Nurture is about having spaces where we support children to develop healthy and supportive relationships and attachments, where we make them feel valued by others and confident in themselves. 
and where we teach them how to communicate constructively and positively. This is important for all children, but particularly so for children who are more vulnerable to experiencing difficulties and exclusion. Nurture, nurture groups also offer the benefit of enabling children to remain part of their mainstream class and work at both primary and secondary level. In this, there are an eminently sensible and feasible ways of tackling some of the most complex issues that children face from a very early stage and in a meaningful and sustainable manner. There appears to me to be an important role for nurture groups as we focus on closing the attainment gap and creating a more truly inclusive educational experience for all of our children. As with inclusive play, I'd be pleased to see some reference to the contribution that could be made by Nurture as the, the final guidance is developed. <coughs> Presiding officer, I'll finish by echoing the Cabinet Secretary's encouragement to all interested parties to contribute to the consultation so that we can continue to improve and ensure that the policy intention of mainstreaming becomes a reality for all our children and young people. Thank you very much. I call Annie Wells to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Annie Wells is the penultimate speaker in the open <coughs> debate. Ms Wells, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. <clears throat> Deciding the best route for any child through education will always be tough. For every change in educational thought, there will always be a question mark over its impact on some children, and never has it been truer than when it comes to children with additional support needs. The context of this debate is key. In the 70s and early 80s, we rightly saw changes in thought with regards to rights of children to be educated, irrespective of their level of disability. In the early noughties, with the introduction of Section 15 of the Standards in Scotland Schools Act, it became an expectation that all children would attend mainstream school, unless certain exception, exceptional circumstances applied to them. I, of course, welcome the principle of mainstreaming, where, an appro where appropriate and where the correct support is provided, which is why today we are supporting the Scottish Government motion. As Liz Smith pointed out, the issue is not with the legislation itself, but with how it is interpreted by local authorities and how support is provided. If legislation is intended in the best interest of the child, adhering to principles that we all agree on, that is social cohesion and integration, then how do we ensure that a well-meaning policy is executed on a case-by-case -case basis in which the needs of an individual child are always duly considered? As highlighted by members in the Chamber today, though there are concerns on what support pupils are getting, I have dealt with cases in my own region whereby parents have raised concerns about the support their children are getting at school. In one case, a child having additional learning support hours outside of the classroom, cut from around seven hours to one and a half. Charities too have raised their concerns, as many in the Chamber have mentioned today. In last year, Enable Scotland reported that seven in 10 pupils with learning disabilities were not getting enough time or attention from teachers to meet their needs. And a survey found a huge 85% of young people with learning disabilities reported that they didn't get the same chances to take part in games as everyone else in school. And also, as Enable points out, these figures serve to highlight that mainstreaming doesn't always mean inclusion. Simply being present at school doesn't mean by default that you become a part of the spectrum of school life. And this is something that we need to address. We again need to look at the context to understand why the concern raised by charities. What support is there in the mainstream schools? How consistent is, is this across the 32 local authorities? And is the support at the level it needs to be? We know there is disparity across the local authorities, definitions of additional support needs, and what constitutes the presumption of mainstream. Whilst the 2004 Act established a broad definition of additional support needs, it still falls to individual councils to define what constitutes additional support needs within these very loose boundaries, meaning that occurrence of additional support needs across local authorities can range from just 6% of pupils being identified in North Lanarkshire to 35% in Aberdeenshire. And since 2012, we know the average local authority spend on additional support needs pupils has fallen by 11%. Even if these decisions are to be taken at local level, we still need to take them into full consideration when discussing 
discussing national legislation. The number of learning support staff from primary schools has been cut by 19% over the past four years, and in secondary schools there has been a 20% reduction in learning support staff. Over the same period, the number of behavioural support staff in primary schools has been cut by 58%. The country's largest teaching union, the EIS, raised its concerns over cuts to special school assistance provisions, highlighting that the impact of these cuts have left the numbers of teachers available to deal with the children with learning disabilities stretched and unable to cope. They noted how not being able to meet these pupils' needs had damaged teacher morale and made them and their pupils feel undervalued and stressed. On top of this, we know that 98% of the education workforce feels that teacher training doesn't adequately prepare, prepare them for teaching young people who have learning disabilities and that 70% of pupils with learning disabilities do not get the time or attention from teachers to meet their needs. Pressures on teachers are rising and what, ma what many in the Chamber would like to hear today is what is being done to reassure staff in mainstream education that they will begin to feel better equipped when it comes to supporting children with special educational needs. It is correct to say that we have made significant strides in recent decades and ensuring that our children have been educated regardless of their disability. And I am pleased that the government motion acknowledges the need to bridge the gap between legislation, policy, and the practical, practical experience of children. Now more than ever, it's important we continue to make positive progress on this front, which is why local authorities and organisations must be given the proper support. There is a worrying trend that can be seen in recent years to the budgets for pupils with additional support needs, and that will only halt progress. We need to look at the bigger picture and work closely across all the local authorities and this chamber, no matter where we represent, to ensure pupils with additional needs continue to get the best opportunities starting out in life. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I call Fulton McGregor, last speaker in the open debate. Mr McGregor, please. Thank you, President Officer. And I support this motion today and congratulate the Parliament and all its administrations on the presumption of mainstreaming. I believe that all children and young people are entitled to and deserve to receive adequate and ample support in order that they can reach their full potential. And I also believe that this sentiment stands regardless of a child's needs or individual requirements, whether they complete their education at mainstream school or an additional support school. And I think that everybody across the chamber has reflected those same sentiments. We must be mindful that children and young people with learning disabilities should not be experiencing exclusion by their peers, by the curriculum, and that they should also not be excluded from opportunities, activities, and social experiences that are an integral part of school life. It is clear to see that some aspects of the delivery of inclusive education has been a challenge, but one that is well worth taking on. A child-centered approach, <coughs> which includes input of family and school staff is absolutely vital, and we must also look at the successes of this policy. I'm pleased that the achievement for pupils with additional support needs continues to rise. 63.2% of 2014-15 leavers with ASN left school with one or more qualifications at um, SCQF level five or better, an increase of 13.1% points since 2011 and 12. And it's also heartening that 88.6% of pupils with ASN had a positive destination, an increase of 6.3% points since 2011 and 12. And I wanted to take my time, President Officer, to use some examples from my uh, constituency. I also used uh, an example of mainstreaming in action. A young person from my constituency has came to my attention recently. He is looked after uh, by the local authority in foster care and is doing really well despite a, a, an extremely uh, difficult um, early life. And despite many discussions um, around prior to him coming into foster care about whether he would be able to manage uh, in mainstream school or not, uh, the young man has been placed in the local primary where he's thriving, integrated in the community with his peers and friends and the various things that go on in the community. He does not have to travel for miles or get transport and is not um, stigmatised by the community. Now, because of anonymity, I, I don't know how many um, foster kids are actually at that particular school. It's a shame I won't actually be able to mention the school in question and give them the praise, but needless to say, um, the, the school in question has worked extremely hard uh, to make that happen and it just does show what what can happen when decisions are made locally by teachers, um, prim primarily head teachers, who know their school communities best and the networks around it in order to support their, their young people. I'd also like to talk about uh, an additional uh, needs school in my 
constituency, Drum Park, a fantastic school that, as it says in their own statement, to put the care and welfare of each individual at the heart of a unique learning experience. And this morning, uh, children from Drum Park were at the Shinari launch in North Lancashire Council, um, and they were, they were singing um, at that launch, and I hope the Minister, uh, Mark MacDonald, in, enjoyed their performance. And on November the 15th, um, they, with their, um, the, the, the school that's on the joint campus, Green Hill, are doing a children's march in Cope Bridge to raise awareness uh, of children's rights in the community um, and bringing together all um, partnership agencies um, in order to do that. And, and I'm hoping to be able to attend that myself. But that's an example of Drum Park and Green Hill, which share a campus um, working together, uh, a mainstream school, an additional support school. And there's a lot of overlap work, and it's absolutely fantastic um, to see. I must highlight the success of mainstreaming is entirely dependent on how it is implemented, of course, and I, like probably every other MSP in here, receive a, a volume of referrals relating to pupils with additional support needs and in in different types of uh, re referrals as well. Um, some parents may be perhaps thinking that their, their, their child um, should be educated elsewhere, or other parents looking for more support in the, in the mainstream environment. Um, and unfortunately, I have experienced a sharp rise in this following um, my own council, North Lancashire Council's de decision to cut ASN support in terms of hours and furthermore cuts to classroom assistance, uh, which were all, also implemented recently and uh, widely publicised. Uh, and a low classroom assistance, perhaps not traditionally in place to uh, assist children with additional support needs, we know that they did uh, have an overall effect uh, in the class. And I've heard countless reports of children who were experiencing uh, you know, who were fl flourishing in the mainstream previously are now struggling uh, and many teaching staff simply don't have the time to de dedicate to children. Uh, I'm referring to, to my own local authority area. So I think we do need to look at it the wider picture, uh, the different decision makers, uh, the government here and, uh, and at local authority level as well. And we've talked about that in uh, many uh, education debates before and how that's joined up. I want to touch briefly on uh, the issue of bullying. All of them and Dale talked about it. And I think that we must continue to support schools across the country. Uh, bullying is a massive issue. Uh, and it can be for children that have got additional support needs uh, as well. Uh, and I don't think the responsibility can fall onto one head teacher or one um, you know, key teacher. Uh, there's got to be a culture that emphasises that bullying won't be tolerated and that everyone should be respected. And we need to get that message out to, to young people at, at as early an age as possible. Now, just last week, I was talking to this, uh, the senior pupils at St Andrews High School in Coatbridge, uh, and that was one of the issues that they raised. And we talked about that in relation to young people's mental health, which was actually really encouraging that young people were, were wanting to, to talk about that openly in, in such a forum. Uh, I, I was very, very uh, encouraged. And um, I, I think that you know, we all agreed during that discussion that a nurturing environment is very important. I do have to say that all the schools across my constituency I've worked on, I do believe, are working towards a, a good a nurture environment within their schools. But of course, there's always more that we can do in that at every level. President officer, I'll finish by saying that I welcome the new guidance and support that aims to set out the bridge, uh, to bridge the gap between legislation policy and day-to-day -day experience. We must ensure that local authorities have the guidance required to help with decision-making and applying the presumption of mainstreaming and that they implement this policy in an efficient and effective manner. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, closing speeches, I call on Daniel Johnson to close for Labour, please, Mr Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to begin by saying I think there was much in the Cabinet Secretary's opening remarks that we can all agree on, and I certainly do. I think he was absolutely right to emphasise the continuity and approach and ethos that we've had since uh, this Parliament came into being, since uh, the Labour and Liberal Democrat uh, uh, administration brought into effect uh, the principle of mainstreaming. I think it uh, underpins and I think evidences a, a, an, an educational approach that's really important. One that views education uh, as being about inclu inclusion and fulfillment of potential. And I think the cabinet secretary made those points very well. Indeed, I think he was also right to point to the fact that this is a rights-based approach because the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child are very clear, Article 24, in terms of disability and the right that children uh, with disabilities have to a decent life and dignity, Article 28, the right to education, and Article 10 tonight, that education is about personality, talents, and abilities. And I think beyond mainstream, if you look at GERFEC, Curriculum for Excellence, and the overall child-centered approach to learning, we see this approach. But there are two overarching and important ideas that the only thing that should limit education is ability, talent, and the ambition of a child. But importantly, in order to achieve this, 
that you need to support it. And I think mainstreaming brings this into sharp focus because it's in mainstreaming of, uh, of children and additional support needs that these things become most challenging. In order to do that, we need understanding, we need support and intervention, and we need resource to deliver that intervention. So I welcome the revived guidance. Indeed, at its heart is that continued ethos that we should, we should welcome. I think it also, as many members have said, I think uh, 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 it, it provides clarification on the application of both policy and legislation. And can I admit that for, for once I'm actually pleased by some of the diagrams and the documentation provided. I think the, 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 the diagrams provide some clarity around how legislation maps onto practice. So can I welcome that? But so, I know, well, well I, thought, I, th I thought the Cabinet Secretary would think so. So uh, Labour agrees and support much of what we uh, have in front of us today and will be uh, uh, voting accordingly. But I think as times we must move beyond simply intent, we must ensure that the uh, we must move beyond just simply understanding and terminology. And as Monica Lennon put it, we must also have action. So what we need to look at is what is happening now and measure what we seek to do through policy against uh, those, uh, those circumstances. And we must seek to challenge and improve it. And as in that, uh, a context of, of, uh, of seeking to improve um, uh, that, that we make our case today. Now, many speakers today have referred to included in the main, and I think it is excellent work. And I could uh, repeat many of the statistics which were set out, but I think Oliver Mundell put it very well, that it's just, it's sad to see those numbers laid so bare. It's sad when you think about the reality that lies behind this. And I would just, I think, repeat one um, statistic from it, that 49% of uh, children with learning disabilities feel uh, that they are not achieving what they might. And I think that is the bar that we must measure ourselves against. So we must look at the 22 recommendations and see what we can do to implement them. Likewise, I think the Education Committee's work has been re uh, referred to by many, and I think, it's, I, I think it was useful work we did. And I would just uh, uh, like to highlight one quote, that additional support needs for a large number of children are not being fully met, and this impacts on their education. So indeed, between these reports, I think there are three key things which they identify and I think which have been identified today. One is about the consistency and quality of practice. Secondly, is around the training of individuals and practitioners. And third is the resource that needs to deliver it. And on the point of practice, just for, for clarity, I, I think the way I would it, uh, explain it is through a personal example. I, I was very lucky to be asked along to sit in on a, a planning meeting for a, a child that was going into one of my local secondary schools. Now, I obviously can't go into any great detail, but the thing that struck me was that people were, and the teachers were moving heaven and earth to deliver the support that child required. However, the, 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 what was being talked about in terms of the resource being made available from the local authority was in terms of the criteria, that because the child didn't meet the criteria, they couldn't deliver the support. To my mind, that is entirely the wrong way around. What should be asked is, what does this child need in order to survive, and how can the local authority best deliver that? Putting criteria in front of that delivery cannot be right. And I think Bob Doris put these points also around practice extremely well. I thought his shopping list he, sh he snuck in at the end of his speech was excellent. The points around the transition from early years into primary school and from primary school to secondary school, standalone units, estate, referrals. And again, I think Jenny Graham, Graham Day made uh, similar points, and I thought Jenny Gould Ruth's point saying that policy can't be just something that a head teacher prints off and he, uh, he or she looks alone. But can I also point to the fact this, that the coordinated support plans uh, are, are only in place for 1.4% of children with additional support needs. And when we look at the drop of the number of children attending specialist schools, there, there is clearly a gap the, the, the number of children attending specialist schools has dropped by almost 20%. So, so for so few additional support needs uh, children to have coordinated support plans, which are meant to bring the resources to bear, to support them in their learning, that just simply cannot be right. And I think these conclusions are supported by including the main in their conclusions, and certainly supported by the Education Committee and its recommendation to have full quality insurance of the implementation of these policies. So I would ask uh, the Cabinet Secretary, when he's listening to the consultation and looking at how to improve, to look at the, the measures for, for quality assurance and implementation. I think Ross Greer made very good points around training. And again, the Education Committee 
heard from a number of teachers and practitioners that too much training is ad hoc, a train the trainer. One person might receive training and they will pass it on. We've seen a reduction in postgraduate uh, uh, um, training uh, for additional support needers and many additional support needs post do not require an additional support needs qualification. That, not, that cannot be right. We need to put that, and we need to make sure that there are qualified people with training so that the support can be delivered. Again, the, the key points from including the main are around initial teacher education, continuous professional development, and inclusion of these issues in the curriculum. But finally, I would just like to uh, uh, mention a resource. Now, I think Ian Gray put it very well. I think his experience of the classroom of what, what resource means and what that means that you can deliver in terms of additional support needs were very clear. And the reality is, is that the number of additional support needs trained teachers is down by 26%. We've seen a reduction of educational psychologists. And, and that results in the situation where many children who are apparently mainstreamed are only, done, are only, uh, only received their mainstream education in a limited way. Examples such as a one hour of, of provision per day and, and, and substandard provision in the classroom. Now I note that my time is at an end, but I think if we are going to honour the rights set out at the beginning of my speech, the, the rights set out in the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child, we must back up understanding with that practice with the training and with the resource, because otherwise we're simply not honouring the ambition set out in those rights. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr Johnson. I call Michelle, ba Michelle Ballantyne to close the Conservatives. Uh, a generous nine minutes. That means a wee bit more. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And may I first refer members to my register of interests, as I am the former head of service of Stable Life, a charity working with children and young people with additional supports needs. I've listened really closely to the contributions this afternoon. They have been very thoughtful, informed, and most pleasingly have shown cross-party commitment to recognise and address the challenges that mainstreaming can bring. This is, without doubt, a complex and multifaceted debate, uh, but it is a debate we must have, and we must be willing to listen and address uncomfortable and difficult evidence, because it is a question that we must get right. We owe that to our children and young people, to their parents, and to all the teachers and support staff, and indeed the partner organisations who strive day after day to deliver inclusive and supportive education for every child. I would say, though, that I really welcome the Cabinet Secretary's announcement today, particularly around the independent research into the experiences of teachers, pupils, and parents. Liz Smith and Ian Gray, both former teachers themselves, captured the plurality of issues and implications arising from the presumption of mainstreaming today. Ian Gray particularly reminds us that, that young people with additional needs are not asking for something special. They're merely asking for the same opportunities that every other child has. And I think it is this that we need to bear in mind as we go through the challenges that we're going to face. Liz Smith drew our attention to the evidence of trainee teachers in, to the Education and Skills Committee in May of this year. This evidence painted an alarming picture, presiding officer, of inadequate provision at teacher training level and of feeling isolated and overwhelmed in the classroom. One young probationary teacher said, we had all these wonderful theories thrown at us, but there was no contextualization, no specific training on autism, dyslexia or dyspraxia, there was absolutely nothing. One fully qualified teacher went further, saying, we are seeing newly qualified teachers coming out who are really quite frightened by some of the behaviours in classrooms and are very unclear about how to begin approaching that, never mind planning a personal learning programme. This is an experienced teacher crying out for help from the Scottish Government. And I hope that such pleas won't fall upon deaf ears. We have heard many, many of our colleagues today, Ian Gray, Jenny Galbraith, Bob Doris, Tavish Scott, Ross Greer, Graham Day, and many others, who have all recognized this issue in their speeches. As many teachers feel cast adrift, as they endeavor to deliver a bespoke education to every child, Enable tell us that 98% of the education workforce surveyed felt that teacher training does not adequately prepare them for teaching young people who have additional support needs. 
We've heard a lot of praise today for Enable's work, and I want to add my voice to that because they captured very well some of the challenges that we face. This presiding officer is the reality on the ground. And without appropriate training and adequate resources, teachers cannot meet the specific needs of ASN children. And their education will suffer as a result. And I recognize the words of the Cabinet Secretary and the Minister when they talked about the increase in good results from ASN children. But I would also say the numbers have increased and some of the partners that work with them are often involved in actually delivering some of those good results. It does take a lot of people to get ASN children well supported and to get good results for them. As Bob Doris have identified in his excellent speech, the right support at the outset could retain children in mainstream education. And it is imperative that we don't put the criteria up as a barrier to addressing children's needs. And this is perhaps sometimes the paradox that we, we face at the heart of the government's support for mainstreaming. They talk in the guidance about the importance of capacity building in mainstreaming and offer warm words on employing specialist support staff and on a focus on the individual needs of the child. But these words sometimes do seem hollow in the context of the recent cuts. As my colleague Annie Wells pointed out, the number of learning support staff in primary schools has been cut by 19% over the past four years and by 20% in secondary schools over the same period. The number of behavioural support staff in primary schools has been cut by 58%. Bob Doris and Oliver Mundell both powerfully invoked examples of informal exclusion and the troubling effect this can have on isolating ASN children in substance, if not in name. And we need a good support staff in order to prevent that. A presumption of mainstreaming shouldn't be a device to cut off access to a range of opportunities, including that of special schools. A presumption for mainstreaming should not be a presumption against special provision. There is a danger that in their enthusiasm sometimes to create equity, the government can actually give rise to an inequitable system that removes the rights of individual choice. Mm -hmm. And there should be a choice. And that choice must always be underpinned by the best interests of the child and, their, and of their development. This point was, was amplified by the comments of Jeremy Balfour, who quite rightly reinforces the fundamental need to ensure the importance of remembering that inclusion is not just about what happens in the classroom we, and that we must keep the individual child at the centre of decision making. And Jeremy also captured the very real issue that the background of the child should not dictate their educational experiences and opportunities, a point that was strongly reinforced by John Mason's contribution. I'm going to be way too quick because the presiding officer gave me lots of extra time. <laughs> Never too there quick. You, there you Never too quick. <laughs> let, let Mr. Doris, you've, you've complimented him. He's desperate to. Oh, sorry, I didn't hear <laughs> it's you. It's a matter for you. Louder. <laughs> to choose your language very carefully, presiding officer. Um, uh, th thank you for, for being complimentary in relation to my speech. I was supportively critical of Glasgow City Council. But I also have some wonderful specialist units in my constituency. And perhaps what I didn't do was praise some wonderful practice. So let me talk about the, the hearing unit in St Rocks and Royston. And let me talk about It's an intervention, Mr Doris, not a second speech. Well, <laughs> and uh, if, sorry. Through the, officer, cha through the chair, Ms Balfour, we're falling apart now. Officer, a finally, question, please, Mr. Something like that would, would be you, handy. Thank you, Presiding Officer. You're so supportive. Can I ask you whether you agree with me <laughs> oh, that, there's no, no, no. that there's excellent examples of support and special needs education, including in my constituency, at the hearing uh, and visual unit at, at, at St Rock's Primary and at the autism unit in High Park and Rock Hill in my constituency? That's fine and that's enough, Mr Doris. Thank you, Ms Valentine. My apologies, Mr Doris. And yes, there are many, many examples of very good support in specialist units and within mainstream support. Um, and that is down to some very dedicated staff. And actually, I want to pick up on, on, on one bit of conversation that did take place during this debate around the need for partnership working. 
and the recognition that actually it takes a family to raise a child, um, a comment you'll often hear in social work circles and in additional need support, and particularly around children who are in looked after and accommodated. And often many of the additional need children are looked after and accommodated as well. And we must recognise that whilst mainstreaming a young person, many of these young people also spend time with partner organisations, um, many from the voluntary sector. And in order to ensure that the children can get the best development and the best results, that engagement with organisations for a period a day or for a day a week or even in some cases two or three days a week can make the difference as to whether they survive in mainstream school or don't survive in mainstream school. And actually that partnership working between teachers and specialists out with the mainstream education can actually be really beneficial to young people. So I hope that the government, when they're doing their work around this, and when we are bringing it forward in terms of guidance, that will be recognised, because teachers can't do this job alone. Um, and it's part of the reason many teachers feel extremely stressed, because so many things now are being pushed back onto teachers. Um, for my own part, I used to head up the drug and alcohol service. M much of that work has now been pushed to teachers who are now expected to become um, experts in this field. So I'm going to turn to my closing remarks now, presiding officer. We on the Scottish Conservative benches do welcome this afternoon's debate and we actually welcome the direction of travel that the government is taking. The Scottish Government's ambition to place the presumption of mainstreaming as a cornerstone of an inclusive approach to education is understandable. But as the evidence from today's debate highlights, the presumption can also have manifest and detrimental effects on a child's education if we don't get the delivery right. Indeed, the Scottish Government's own guidance says, and I quote, more needs to be done, more can be done to get it right for every child. I fully support GERFEC, um, and if we are serious about getting it right for every child, then they must first commit to getting it right for every teacher. And there we must conclude. <laughs> Amazing. <it's> <laughs> <laughs> Your time has been used up magnificently. So, no, no, so you must conclude. In good conscience, I please ask you to support our amendment and support our teachers. Well, Thank there you, you are. Uh, I now call Mark MacDonald to close for the government minister till five o'clock, please. Thank you, presiding officer. At the point at which Michelle Ballantyne had run out of things to say, I was kind of grateful because I've got a lot to get through. Uh, alas, it's okay. Um, we'll just crack on anyway. I want to pick up on a point that Michelle Ballantyne raised, though, where she, she spoke about the, the point which the Cabinet Secretary had uh, raised and which I had uh, reiterated in an intervention uh, to Mr Gray about the increase uh, in terms of positive outcomes. And she said that can be explained by the fact that the number of children with additional support needs has increased. But the point is, is that what we're talking about here are the percentages. So yes, the global sum uh, will have increased, but so too have the percentage of children within that total who are achieving positive outcomes. Therefore, whether one looks at it in terms of a global sum or in terms of a percentage, the trajectory is positive in relation to that. Presiding officer, the approach that the government takes uh, in relation to children and young people uh, generally uh, is underpinned uh, by our commitment to the principles of GERFET, getting it right for every child. And I've said at many an event that for me the key word in that is every and that the approach that we should take is to uh, view every child in Scotland as a unique individual capable of achieving his or her full potential whatever that may be. And that is no more uh, different in relation to children uh, with additional uh, support needs and disabilities than it is for any other child. But I'll come back to that as, as we go through the, the discussion that has taken place in the debate, because I think, as members have rightly highlighted, there is still a journey that we need to travel in relation to that uh, on this agenda. Um, Liz Smith asked, um, regard, well, raised, raised a question regarding what, under, what was underpinning uh, decisions in relation to mainstreaming and what were the factors that were motivating some of those decisions. Uh, we've uh, reiterated in the guidance that there are, there are very, three very clear exemptions uh, in relation to uh, mainstream education. That is where it would not be suited to the ability or aptitude of the child, uh, where it would be incompatible with the provision of efficient, of efficient education for the children with whom the child would be educated, or would result in unreasonable public expenditure being incurred, which would not ordinarily be, 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 would not ordinarily be incurred. 
And the interesting thing about that is that the resource question is actually not uh, being framed in that respect in the way in which members have suggested. Because a number of members have suggested that mainstreaming is being done as a means by which to uh, save money. In actual fact, what we are looking at here is that often in the situations which members describe, that is not the actual uh, outcome uh, and is actually something which should not be used as a motivation because often it is the, the flip which is true in relation to the support that is required for those pupils. Um, Bob, uh, Ian Gray uh, stated that the positive outcomes which were highlighted to him were a testament to the hard work of teachers and support staff. And yes, that absolutely is the case. And the government recognises the hard work and dedication of those staff members. And I hope that today one of the messages that comes from the Chamber loud and clear, and certainly seems to have come loud and clear from the Chamber, uh, is how much we value the work that those staff are doing in our schools. Um, I'll give way briefly to Mr Gray. Yeah. Ian Gray. The, the Minister makes an entirely fair point, but he has to also ac accept uh, that those teachers need more support from us than simply warm words. They need the resources to do the job that they're doing so well. Minister. Yes, well, uh, let, let me, let, well, let me turn to the question of resource, which I was going to come to a little bit later. So if we look at the uh, local government financial statistics for 2015-16, uh, the spend on education was £4.9 billion uh, across Scotland. That's a 2.7% increase on 2014-15, a 1.9% real terms increase. Uh, of that, the £584 million was spent on additional support for learning. That's an increase of £5 million on the previous year's figure. So we do see increases in terms of expenditure. But I'll come back to the point about resources uh, a little bit later on uh, in relation to the, the wider debate that we've had today. Uh, I thought Jenny Gilruth uh, very uh, importantly highlighted uh, some of the questions that we do need to, to face in relation uh, to the story of, of Jamie. And it was brought up by a number of members across the chamber, the question uh, around how exclusion uh, works in relation to children. And we are very clear that exclusion uh, must be viewed uh, as a last resort. I think in terms of the point that was made by some members about how we uh, categorise and uh, gather data in relation uh, to informal uh, exclusion within uh, the school building. There are some questions around how easy it would be uh, to capture uh, that data without it potentially uh, creating uh, additional burden, but we'll give consideration uh, to that. Um, Bob Doris uh, asked about uh, guidance in relation to transitions. Uh, the guidance is included in the Code of Practice for ASL uh, and there are duties on education authorities on planning for transitions. Uh, I'm also working to develop a framework for supporting children and young people uh, affected by disability and their families. Uh, part of that work will be around looking uh, at how we uh, ensure that transitions are managed effectively uh, and appropriately. Jackie Bailey highlighted the work of Enable Scotland, uh, as did a number of other members, and uh, we're very pleased that we were able to work with Enable Scotland in the development of the guidance, uh, and they have been uh, positive in relation to the, the work that has been done uh, and the guidance itself, which, uh, as members have highlighted, and it was brought up uh, across the chamber by a number of members, Jeremy Balfour uh, in particular mentioned this, uh, about the need for this to be about more than just a presence in the classroom. Indeed, if we look at uh, page six of the guidance uh, under participants, uh, the key expectations uh, include all children and young people will have the opportunity to participate and engage as fully as possible in all aspects of school life, including school trips and extracurricular activity. So we recognise that this is about ensuring that uh, the entire experience is inclusive for those children, not simply the fact that they can gain access to the classroom and the educational opportunities uh, contained within. I thought again Graham Day uh, highlighted again uh, a very balanced contribution uh, as many contributions were highlighting some of the concerns at a local level concerns which members across the chamber will recognize from their post bags where uh, things are not necessarily uh, working in the best interests of children and families but also highlighting that it's at the same time there are positive examples out there of where the work is being done to provide those positive outcomes for children and young people and he highlighted uh, in particular positive use of pupil equity funding, an example from his constituency, but one which I'm sure we could all echo uh, from our own communities and our own schools. Monica Lennon uh, highlighted uh, the issues around, for example, deaf pupils, and uh, obviously the government recently uh, launched the BSL National Plan. Part of that will be to drive uh, some of the inclusion uh, around BSL uh, users and deaf pupils, so we will hope to see improvement on the back of the targets that have been set in relation to the BSL plan. Uh, she also mentioned exclusion, and as I've said, 
that must always be a last resort. She also mentioned bullying, and that was brought up again by uh, a number of other members across the chamber. Uh, the government has given very clear commitments in relation to prejudice-based bullying in terms of our evidence to the relevant committees on that, and I'm, uh, I'm aware that the committees are seeking opportunities to bring uh, a debate to the Chamber uh, where the Chamber will have its opportunities to have its say in relation to prejudice-based bullying. So I look forward to those, uh, those discussions and debates uh, continuing. Uh, Fulton McGregor uh, cited uh, a number of positive outcomes and also mentioned Drum Park Primary, who had the, I had the great pleasure to meet today uh, at the uh, launch of the Gurfec Toolkit uh, in Uddingston, um, where they put on a fantastic performance. But he also highlighted the uh, important work uh, being done in relation to Greenhill and Drum Park uh, being a positive example uh, of uh, mainstream and ASN co-location and co-working as well, and the impact that that is having for the pupils from Drum Park, but also for the pupils from Green Hill. And I should uh, declare my interest, presiding officer, obviously, as a, as a parent of a child with additional support needs. And I've seen in the school that my son attends, which is co-located mainstream and additional support needs, fantastic examples of the benefits not just delivered to the pupils with additional support needs, but also to the mainstream pupils as well, who have the opportunity for interaction uh, with those pupils and learn uh, a great deal in terms of the citizenship elements uh, of uh, the curriculum for excellence. <clears throat> A number of points have been made in this debate about resources. Um, John Mason, I thought, highlighted very importantly that what we have to have uh, is a debate about not just resources, but also prioritisation. And there is a debate to be had about uh, the priorities we attach to resources. The government uh, is in a position where we are willing to listen to that debate and listen to what members ask are in relation to that. But I would just say gently, to the Conservative benches because a number of speakers on the Conservative benches focused on uh, the issues around budgets and the issue around wanting to see more spend. They cannot come to this chamber and continually ask for additional spend across a range of areas, including in terms of education, when at the same time they are part of a, a party who at a UK government level are driving forward austerity which is impacting on the budget of this parliament. But beyond that, where they as a party in this chamber are proposing a taxation policy which would see a £140 million reduction in public spending. So they, I'm willing to have a debate with members across this chamber about resources and about prioritisation. But I say to the Conservatives, they must come at this from a position of at least some self-awareness when it comes to talking about the allocation of public resources. Thank you. That concludes our debate on the presumption of mainstreaming. We come to decision time, and the first question is that Amendment 8558.1 in the name of Liz Smith, which seeks to amend Motion 8558 in the name of John Swinney on the presumption of mainstreaming, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote, and members may cast those votes now. The result of the vote on Amendment 8558.1 in the name of Liz Smith is yes, 59, no, 55. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. The next question is that Amendment 8558.3 in the name of Ian Gray, who seeks to amend the motion in the name of John Swinney, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote and members may cast those votes now.
The result of the vote on Amendment 858.3 in the name of Ian Gray is yes, 59, no, 53. There was one abstention. The amendment is therefore agreed. And the final question is that Motion 8558 in the name of John Swinney as amended on the presumption of mainstreaming be agreed. Are we agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote and members will cast the votes now. The result of the vote on motion 8558 in the name of John Swinney as amended is yes 59 there were no zero sorry no zero votes and there were 55 abstentions the motion the motion as amended is therefore agreed and that concludes decision time i now close this meeting